And what is up, everyone? It's the top of the hour here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and you know what that means. It's time to kick the tires and light the fires, Big Daddy. (laughs) It's time for the Digital Dash. I am your host, Javier Reyes, and for the next three hours, I'm going to be talking to you about all the stories, impressions, unabashed opinions, and little idiosyncrasies that exist out there in the world of pop culture goodness, and sometimes featuring only, and I mean only, the most illustrious of guests. And this week, we certainly have that. I'm going to be talking to my friend Kayla Marcato and her friend Elisa Kesting, hopefully I said that name correctly, uh, about A Star is Born and its award season potential and Bradley Cooper and all that stuff. Uh, And then next I'm calling my friend, uh, the master of the dark arts, Mr. Tommy Byrne, to talk about some anime stuff in the form of Naruto Road to Ninja, the movie, and My Hero Academia. Uh, And lastly, I'll be going solo and talking about one of my favorite games of all time, The World Ends With You which just had its final remix uh, port launch for the Nintendo Switch this past Friday. But before that, of course, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be going through the news roundup in the form of the opening dash. It's going to be a great show, guys. Really excited for it. And as you can tell, I actually prepared an intro this time and did it correctly. So yeah, stay tuned. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. And what's up, guys? We're back here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. We're back. We're doing the opening dash. But first, I'm also joined by a guest today uh, for the opening dash because you just decided to show up, apparently. Mr. Anthony Gabinelli, the sports editor of the Montclair and Student Newspaper. What's going on, man? What's up? What's up, man? What's up? So you're just hanging out? Yeah. All right, cool. Feeling good. Feeling good? Breathing good. Breathing good? All good. And also, I wanted to give a shout out to my friend Nick Carr, who just sent me a text uh, a couple seconds ago, more like a minute ago. Uh, and not going to lie, was pretty surprised by it. I haven't talked to him in a long time, a really old friend of mine. And he says he's a big fan of the show and he tunes in regularly. So hopefully I keep him tuning in regularly. Don't want to lose a fan or anything like that. That would be bad. Uh, but, you know, I understand. Why wouldn't he be a fan of the show? You know what I mean? We only have the most illustrious of guests on here. You know what I mean, Anthony? You get what uh, I'm saying? A season regular. A season regular, Mr. Anthony Gavinelli. So, without further ado, let's get into the opening dash, starting with movies and TV news. Uh, story number one, Warner Bros. reportedly is going to hire James Gunn for Suicide Squad 2. Yeah. Reading now from The Verge. <laughs> Thanks. Reading now from The Verge, James Gunn, the director of the first two Guardians of the Galaxy movies, is moving across the comic store aisle to Marvel's biggest cinematic superhero rival, DC to write the script for the next installment in the Suicide Squad franchise, according to a report from Polygon. The news comes after Disney fired Gunn ahead of the production launch for his planned movie, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, in a controversial series of events that saw a number of offensive jokes that Gunn made on Twitter in 2009 and 2010, resurfaced by right-wing Pizzagate conspiracy theorist Mike Cernovich. Uh, I talked about this over the summer and was basically like, not at all endorsing what James Gunn said, but I did feel like this, this mob mentality of kind of uh, destroying people for past mistakes needs to be calmed down a little bit and that I thought that the comparisons between what happened to him and Roseanne were were, were misguided and I thought that what happened with Roseanne was something that she tweeted today not literally today but when it happened that day versus Gunn who was back in 2009 and also he had apologized for those things after that even before he was hired on as the Guardians of the Galaxy director Um, so I thought that that was a, a, a poor move on Disney's behalf but uh you know, we're going to keep rolling right through this unless you want to say anything, Anthony. Um, okay, we're moving on. Uh, <laughs> hey, you come on my show, you play by my rules, all right, man? Um, yeah, keep giving me that look. <laughs> I'm just going to say that uh, I really don't know how exactly you can keep doing the DC Universe when your Superman guy is MIA. Yeah, good point, good point. So... It might just be its own standalone movie, in which case mm. I don't really care for it because the first one was that bad. Yeah, good it was, point. It was really bad, so I'm still not going to watch it. And uh, now let's move on to the next story. Uh, Ryan Coogler has signed on to write and direct Black Panther's sequel. Really? This via Yes, really. Yeah, you heard this for the first time on yeah. Digital Dash. That's great. Uh, this via The Hollywood Reporter. The filmmaker behind the $1.3 billion hit is expected to begin penning the follow-up next year, says Sources. Uh, Sources tell The Hollywood Reporter that the filmmaker behind Marvel's landmark Black Panther has secretly or quietly closed a deal to write and direct the sequel. While the movie was expected, Marvel wanted to keep the creative team as intact as possible, and a sequel was never in any real doubt. 
the time it was always unclear. Uh, Black Panther said Siren T'Challa, the king of a fictional African country, was an outsized, outsized success both com- commercially and critically. The pick, which starred Chadwick Boseman as the titular hero, grossed 700 million domestically and more than 1.3 billion worldwide, and is also a contender for Oscar consideration. The movie became a defining cultural moment and touchstone, especially for the black community. Uh, I agree. Uh, I know you and I at first didn't love the movie, but it's slowly dawned on us that there's just a lot of smart, like yeah. really good movie type of jargon that's going it's a, on. It's, that a, it's a great, it's a great, uh, great produced movie. Uh, I don't think it's one of the best Marvel movies, mm-hmm. but I still think it's one of the most well pro- uh, production wise. It's one mm-hmm. of the better ones. That's fair. That's fair. And just like subtlety is also really, really good in there. So mm-hmm. that's great that they got him back. It's gonna be yeah. a good movie. Then I'm so, I'm still gonna see it for so. sure. Uh, next up on the list, Craven the Hunter. His movie may feature Spider Man. That's right. Reading now from Slash Film, Craven the Hunter movie will include Spider Man. Maybe <laughs> Sony may intend to launch their Spider Man cinematic user universe without the help of Spider Man, but that won't stop the screenwriter of the upcoming Cra- Craven the Hunter movie from dreaming big. Screenwriter Richard Wenk claims that the solo film of frequent Spider Man villain Craven the Hunter will feature an appearance from the friendly neighborhood superhero himself. Whether that will actually come to pass is another story. Is it a Sony movie or? Yeah, it's a Sony movie. You know their whole villain universe thing that they've been trying to get going. Starting with Venom. Yeah, starting with Venom, they want to make the Black Cat, Silver Sable thing. Like, every character except Spider-Man, Spider-Man universe. That's basically what they're trying they're to do. They're essentially taking all the good villains and stuff from Marvel. Yeah, yeah okay. kind of. Yeah. So, I'm sure that'll go along great. That'll mm-hmm. go along great, right? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I, um, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by the movie only because Craven does have, as a huge Spider-Man savant, he does have one of the great Spider-Man stories ever, which is Craven's Last Hunt. Uh, the comic. Uh, I recommend people checking that out if they're big Spider-Man fans. It's really, really good. Like it's it's a good example of how taking a character without much of a rich history or context or anything like that to him, uh, taking him and you can make him awesome. You know what I mean? It's a good example of that. Where's so. Big Wheel? <laughs> big Wheel. Don't Where's Big Wheel? Ever, don't ever say that again. Uh, we're gonna Where keep moving he? though. No, I want stay on this subject. I don't subject. know. Where's, no. Where's his movie? Anthony, I got people coming on. All right, they he, might be listening right he's now. He's the greatest saying, D-list villain ever. No, no the greatest Get D-list villain ever is a shocker. Anyway, uh, first poster and teaser of Disney's Aladdin. Didn't see it. Was uh, shown last week. Uh, this via Slate magazine. Uh, a trailer for the new live-action Aladdin remake opens with the bird's eye view of shimmering sand dunes that rush by to reveal Agrabah, the fictional city from the original film. However, the most nostalgic part of this teaser is its soundtrack. After some familiar music that wavers between wondrous and sinister, a deep rumbling voice warns only one may enter here. The diamond in the rough, and it shows the little lion head thing or whatever. Classic oh, no. shot from the Lion King. Cave of Wonders, of course. Uh, so they, they didn't show in the teaser. I know you haven't seen it. They showed the poster and all that, and Will Smith, of course, is the big star of this, uh, meaning like the biggest name attached to it, I should mm-hmm. say, uh, and he's playing the genie. They didn't actually show the genie in the trailer, but uh, I'm kind of happy about that because I don't want them to you know, completely uh, spoil everything immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, looking forward to that. That is coming out. Hold on a second. I actually did not get the... The date, uh, May 24th, 2019 is when Aladdin, the live action is so set to release. So our graduation day or something like that. Something like that. Or a commencement or whatever that is. Next on the list, Brian Tyree Henry is going to be joining the cast of Godzilla vs. Kong. Who? Brian Tyree Henry from Atlanta. That's why I'm okay. putting this on. I love that show. Uh, reading from Deadline, Brian Tyree Henry nominated for Emmys this year for FX's Atlanta and NBC's This Is Us, as well as a Tony for The Lobby Hero. Has closed the deal to join legendary Warner Brothers Warner Brothers' Godzilla vs. Kong. He joins Millie Bobby Brown, Diane Dene Guerrera, and Julian Dennison to help lead the ensemble cast. Uh, Adam Wingard directed directs the fourth installment of the Monster Universe franchise, which has a May 22nd, 2020 release date. Uh, I only put this in just because, one, I actually thought King of the Monsters, the that they teased over the summer from the Comic-Con trailer, actually looked pretty cool. And also, I love Brian Tyree Henry. He's awesome. Uh, really, really exceptional actor, for sure. If you guys I, haven't seen Atlanta, I really highly recommend it. I love uh, both the uh, Godzilla movie and the King Kong movie that came out the last couple of years. I think Godzilla is a really underrated movie, mm-hmm. um, simply because I think everyone doesn't like the fact that there's no Godzilla in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that it makes up because every scene that he's in is spectacular. It really is. It's amazing. It's it takes a you while to slow burn. You can't tell me though. it's a bad movie when every scene he's in is phenomenal. You can't. I mean, yeah, it's 15 minutes of the movie and it's like a 2-hour movie, but like 
the story's good enough where I can carry it where it carried me throughout mm-hmm. the whole yeah. movie. Yeah. And then uh, King, King Kong, King of the uh, King of the King of the Apes. Uh, yeah, another great movie. Mm-hmm. Great For cast, sure. great great lines in it too. Very quotable. For sure. And speaking of great lines, we're gonna get back to more of those headlines. Uh, right after a short break. And we're back here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Forgot to shut off my mic for a little bit. Not the worst thing in the world, but it's okay. We did get the ad still through. That was a little freaky. See what happens when you come on the show, Anthony? You just distract me and ruin everything. So thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, (laughs) uh, So just going to finish up the opening dash, go through some of the remaining stories that I have on here. Uh, Just two more movies and TV news. Uh, True True Detective Season 3 has finally revealed its release date. Uh, we knew HBO's anthology series would be returning with a third installment in January. The question has been when exactly in January. Uh, it, ha- it has been reported that it will launch on January 13th, 2019 uh, as the next installment starring Mr. Mahershala Ali. Uh, I know I, I put this in because my friend John's been on the show a couple times and he's given me the assignment of watching True Detective season one. So going to be interested to see how that one turns out but i have to watch season one and two first so we'll the see. father is a very big fan oh, of the big, show oh the also shout out the father. <laughs> father is he listening right now uh it's probably i don't know what his schedule is on monday to be honest with you fair he could he could be who does who who honestly knows their schedule it's monday, monday. garfield's you know I mean? least favorite day yeah garfield's least favorite day all right and then last story for movie and tv news netflix has canceled season three of Mar- uh netflix wow marvel's iron fist uh mm-hmm. reading now from deadline just over a month after its significantly improved second season launched on Netflix, the streaming service has delivered a knockout cancellation punch to Marvel's Iron Fist. Marvel's Iron Fist will not return for a third season on Netflix, said the Disney-owned co- comic giant and the streamer in a joint statement to Deadline today. Everyone at Marvel Television and Netflix is proud of this series and grateful for all of the hard work from our incredible cast, crew, and showrunners, Marvel and Netflix added. We're thankful to the fans who have watched these two seasons and for the partnership we shared on this series. While the series on Netflix has ended, the immortal Iron Fist will live on. See what they did there. Um, I never watched the show, so I don't really have any other things to say. What about you? I watched the first season. It was a, it was a trip to get through. It was a chore just to watch really? all that 10, so? 13 episodes of it. It was bad. Mm. Oh, it's so bad. It's so boring. It is, really? It was, it, I really wouldn't recommend it. I haven't watched the second season. I don't know anyone who really has, but yeah, this, was just, this, isn't, this isn't good. It's no, not I feel good. you, man. I feel you. Um, where's now, my, where's my red flannel? Where's re- <laughs> what? Wait, what? Where's, where's my red? You, do you watch Anthony Fantano? Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. I should have gotten that reference. Yeah. You, you and I both love Fantano. Um, yeah, just shout, uh, not shout good explosion. Fantano. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now moving on to gaming news. Uh, only a few stories here today. I'm going to try and go through those really quickly. Uh, PSN name changes have officially been announced this via IGN.com. Uh, reading from there. Uh, after years of PlayStation owners being unable to change their PSN names, Sony has officially announced that they will be soon testing the PSN online uh, ID change feature beta to allow users around the world to finally change their ideas. Uh, revealed on the PlayStation blog, the PSN online ID change feature beta will initially be part of their PlayStation preview program and will become available to select users that have pre-registered as testers for previous PS4 system software betas. Talked about this a lot and how it's just incredible that they haven't been able to to get this out. I can't and I they can't f- wait to change my name from XXX Swag McGillicuddy XXX to That's XXX definitely not your name. X360 uh, No Scope Swag. By Charger XXX. Boy 117, which is hilarious. <laughs> Were you seven? <laughs> Somehow better than worse than some of the early Xbox usernames I had. I had some bad ones early Xbox. I had like tons of fun, I think was one of my first ones. Wow. <laughs> Which actually, I wish was still. I wish I would take that over Charger Boy at this point, though, for PSN anyway. But yeah, um, so that's cool. Uh, we'll see how that turns out, and if they Sony messes that up or anything like that. Uh, next story: Nielsen rankings show that Call of Duty Black Ops Four is the most anticipated game this holiday, even more than Red Dead Redemption Two, Super Mario Party, Spider Man, and Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. This via game industry up is. Though Halloween and Thanksgiving still stand between consumers and the biggest holiday sales, it's nonetheless the season for retailers and analysts to anticipate holiday gaming purchases. Nielsen, for his part, has released a ranking of the most anticipated games of the coming holidays, showing Call of Duty Black Ops for just edging out over Red Dead Redemption 2 in a survey of nearly 6,000 people. I put this on here because I just wanted to say a lot of people love to give the Call of Duty franchise a lot of crap, sometimes justifiably so. Crap on the radio? I think so, yeah. 
Why are you out of me like this? I'm just I'm asking. never having you on. You're just ruining me. I'm just asking, all right? <laughs> I appreciate I can't you say, can say I can't that. say half my lingo on the radio, so. Yeah, that's true. I don't think, I think you can say that. I hope I can. If Annabelle's listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, maybe I should just, uh, whatever, too late now. Anyway, um, uh, yeah. I just put this on here because I thought it was, a lot of people are like almost rooting for Call of Duty to fail, mm-hmm. and it's like, guess what a lot of people still play and it's still i think mechanically wise it's one of the best shooters that you can get on the market so so here's my thing with it it's with that rating system uh first off you didn't no one really knew smash brothers ultimate was coming out this mm-hmm. year no one really knew it was gonna be a thing we all were like oh yeah smash for switch when's coming where where, where you at boy and we didn't hear it till like april may yeah something like that yeah and it's essentially just uh like uh, it's an upscaled our, one, though. It's like it's they're adding a lot of new characters, and they got a mm-hmm. mode we don't know about yet. Yeah, it's just it's Smash for Wii U 3DS Plus. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, but this is not Call of Duty, re- which not, has been coming out. It's every not year. a remake. It's not like a like a uh, brand new edition. It's just it's like its own thing now. Yeah, it is definitely. Its um, own thing. And then Super Mario Party, I really don't think anyone was enjoy was like looking forward to, but I have played it many times, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's right. My I boy Dry Bones. I have boy Dry Bones is in the game. I haven't Man. unlocked them yet. I haven't unlocked them yet. You know I have you, to do that. You, you just gotta you wait. Just wander around. Yeah. yeah which you, is the most Dry Bones thing ever. Dry Bones shows up when he wants to. Everybody they're knows al- that. they're always gonna be in the back. So don't like go looking around. Yeah, everywhere. yeah. They're always gonna be in the back part. Okay, cool. So like, yeah, when you do, uh, you get DK, Diddy Kong, mm-hmm. uh, Pom Pom. Cool to see that they added Donkey Kong back instead of just a space. That's cool to see. I figured they had um. Bowser as a playable character now, mm. so they might as well do it with Donkey Kong as well. True, true, true. Uh, but next story, moving on. Uh, Maybe more characters and stuff for that because like the roster and uh, and the maps are a little low. So, um. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, next up, are you coming in? <laughs> uh, someone's at the door right now. Um, hello, sir. Um, Microsoft. Is mm-hmm. closing in to buy Obsidian Entertainment. This via Gotaku. Microsoft is finalizing a deal to acquire the independent development studio Obsidian Entertainment, according to three people briefed on the negotiations. <laughs> we don't know if Inc. is on paper yet, and plenty of major acquisition deals have fallen apart in the final hours, but those close to the companies believe it is all but done. Um, Obsidian, best known for its work on critically acclaimed role playing games like Knights of the Old Republic 2 in 2004 and Fallout New Vegas, has been independent since it was founded in 2003. The Irvine, California-based studio has long been beloved by RPG fans, but has often faced financial strains, nearly going out of business in 2012 before it signed a deal for an online tank game and launched a Kickstarter for the isometric throwback that would become Pillars of Eternity. Big get for them. Huge get for Microsoft. Here's the well, thing. Well, how the like, yeah, only three. We got it from. We got this information from three people. <laughs> hey, this guy though, who's reporting Jason Shire, is really good. I trust him. Jason like Shire, Kotaku. Kotaku is really I'm good. not knocking it. I just, no, no, I know. What you're I saying. just love the wording of it. Like, yeah, no, 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 three only. people. That's yeah, yeah. our. That's our sources. Three yeah. people that um, uh, knew about it. Uh, I put this on here also because I think people need to realize. Yes, PlayStation's dominating and Nintendo came back, but do not sleep on Microsoft for the next generation of consoles. They've pushed a lot check out a lot of their e3 coverage from this past year uh for a bigger box and for the fact that they've been acquiring so many interesting studios like ninja theory was one of them and they they have their own called the coalition i believe i forgot what the name of their own new studio was that's a big deal because remember sony is the one who came up and put resources into creating their own studio you know what studio that was naughty dog last time i checked they're probably one of the great best developers in the entire industry having been made uncharted and the last of us and uh jack and daxter and crash bandicoot so yeah, there it's there's it's an upside thing. You know what I mean? It'll take time, but Microsoft is coming back for sure. So everybody keep an eye eye on for that. Uh, next story: Stardew Valley this is a short one. Stardew Valley is coming to iOS. Uh, this via Polygon. Stardew Valley's next home is on mobile. Uh, it's playable on nearly every current console and handheld, but not smartphones. At least not until now. The hit farming sim is coming to iOS and Android with the iOS version launching later this month. Uh, I say it's the full game. It's going to release on October 24th and will cost seventy ninety nine and have no microtransactions. I just know it's a big game. Decided to put that in here. It's not going to be Pokemon Go, though. Yeah, I know. It's not going to be Pokemon Go. But people are into Stardew Valley, so good for them. And lastly, to round out the news, Bully, one of my favorite games ever. I talked about this on the Morning Buzz this morning if you guys weren't uh, listening. There's been some rumors, Anthony. There's been some I saw voices. your retweet. Yeah, I know. I lost my mind. I said I needed medical attention. Um... There's been some rumors. I'm going to read now quickly from the Daily Star. Uh, again, these are just rumors. Uh, 
All eyes may be on Red Dead Redemption 2 as Rockstar ramps up for the release of the game, but the developer could have something else on the back burner right now, too. This week, news has emerged that the developer may be working on another AAA title and has already started casting calls for the game. That game is Bully 2, a follow-up to the PS2 critically acclaimed uh, school simulator that released well back in 2006. Super excited for this. Don't have enough time to go into it in more depth, but uh, let me tell you guys, I've been waiting for this one for a while. A long, long time. And that does it for the opening dash in terms of the news. Now to just quickly get into the reads of the week, uh, my three articles slash whatever that I recommend for this week. Uh, number one is Elite College Admissions Are Broken. This is from The Atlantic by uh, the author Aliyah Wong. Uh, I actually disagreed with some of the assertions and some of the things she said in this piece, but I thought it was a really good read about you know college and universities and the, the metrics we use for determining, in a way, intelligence and determining what it takes to get into certain Ivy League schools, uh, especially considering Harvard is going through a kind of lawsuit right now, which the piece touches on. Um, so I recommend that one. Uh, another one, Beware Bachelor Nation of the Ballot Box. This one via The Hollywood Reporter, and it is by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, NBA legend. Uh, NBA legend. And that one was cool. I love Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in a lot of different ways. Uh, in terms of his impact on basketball, but also because he certainly is a fantastic writer. And I think people uh, don't realize that exactly. He writes a lot for The Guardian and The High Reporter. He's excellent. Um, and he doesn't just write like you would think he just writes basketball stuff, you know what I mean? But he does a lot more than that. Uh, and then my last recommendation is Grim Fandango at 20, the year the Grim Reaper came for adventure games. This one via The Ringer by Matt James. Grim Fandango by the studio Double Fine. Uh, they're a great studio, and I love seeing what they do. And this is one of their classics. And I just thought it was a cool uh, oral history kind of piece going over that game and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's it. Also, remember to go check out the school paper in the, Mon the Montclairian. Um, I'm the assistant entertainment editor there, and there's really lots of great stuff being pumped out every week. You can pick up the hard copy on Thursdays and any, and <clears throat> at any of the bins scattered around campus. And usually Wednesday night, Thursday morning, you can also check out the articles on the website, themontclarion.org. Uh, this week, I should have two articles of my own published. One about the one being about the oversimplifications of uh, the superhero genre that are made people, you know, the snobbish writers out there and stuff. And also about the NBA season, uh, about the Golden State Warriors. Then I'm writing for you, Anthony, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, guys, that's it for the opening dash. We're going to take a, a bit of a break here. And when we come back, talking Star is Born with my two friends, Kayla and Alicia. Uh, Alicia, I always mess up her name. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So stay tuned, guys. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. And we're back, everybody, here on 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. Uh, <laughs> why are you already laughing? <laughs> Hold on one second. Uh, do -do -do. And hello, are you guys there? <laughs> hello? Oh, us? Yeah. Hi. No, no, Hi. the other person, the, the poster that's in the room with me. There was someone else in the room. What? There was someone else in the room when you are giving your... um. The beginning talks. The beginning talks. Oh, yeah, that's true, actually. You, you're right. You got me there. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, um, I'm being joined right now by Kayla Marcato and Alicia. <laughs> Casting. <laughs> Casting. Um, <laughs> who I've never personally met, but I know her through Kayla, uh, who was mm -hmm. on the show this past summer. Oh, they know. Don't they know. They know. They, know. they remember. Everyone remembers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh i decided to have you guys on um because oh actually uh alicia if you want to uh you can introduce yourself because this is your first time on the show oh okay um i'm alicia i'm kayla's roommate and uh that's it <laughs> <laughs> That's all you have to say about no you? that's great because i've been waiting for someone to finally just be like yeah that's it what else is there to know? What else would I say? You can She's say whatever you want. She's acapella group. She has the best voice I've ever heard in my entire life. Really? That's awesome. She won't let me in the acapella group for reasons I unknown to me. <laughs> she, has, she has a great Twitter, um, too. I would say that. That's the only thing I know. Great retweets and all that stuff. Good stuff. Kayla She's an accounting major, so she's smart. Really? That's mm -hmm. awesome. What? Yeah, you guys you guys are both very smart, I can tell. Just the way your, one, like, from your my nose hat, is practically my inside the camera right now. <laughs> Yeah, the University. Monsters University hat. <laughs> Everything. The whole thing. Um, it's really low. So, yeah. Uh, I wanted to have you guys on because A Star is Born came out. Yeah, it did. Yeah, we saw it, it opening night. You guys saw it oh, opening wait. night. I saw it yesterday morning because I, for some reason, didn't get to see it the weekend before. And then Kayla confirmed to me 
really just in a shocking way when we went out for sushi the other day with with all of our friends. We're just like, hey, guys, I want to announce I'll be on the show Monday. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is the first time hearing this, too. <laughs> well, he kept asking me and I kept like. I know, but you kept saying, people. maybe, probable. I have you to ask. You had four midterms on Thursday. She was busy. Oof. I did. Yeah, well, I got my midterms coming up, too. Really excited for that. But anyway, um, so yeah, let's get right into it. First of all, what did you guys think? What did you think of I, A Star Is Born? I loved it. Loved it. I liked it, too. You liked it? It was, liked it was it like too? a long movie, but it didn't feel like a long movie. Yeah, it's like two no. and, two hours and fifteen minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it didn't like it. Like it. Like it went on for a long time, but I wasn't sitting like, okay, when is this gonna end? Mm, I get what you mean. I think that this is. I mean, this movie. What's funny is that this came out the same weekend that Venom came out, and really online, mm-hmm. you're getting a lot of like clashing going on right now where. There's, like, people who hate people who like The Star is Born, but liked Venom. Like, there, it's like a battle <laughs> that's going Did on. Did you right see now. Venom? No, I haven't seen Venom yet. Mmm. 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 Big fan. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That's, so my vote has been <laughs> casted, clearly, for which side I'm on. Um, mm. But what's interesting about this movie, I mean, among a lot of other things, is that I didn't think that when it was announced, I mean, A Star is Born is kind of a, I don't want to say old concept, but it's been done before. You know, it's basically kind of a remake. Uh, it's been b- done a bunch of times. I p- think the last one was like 1954, actually. But in the 70s, you know, yeah, in the or in the 70s, yeah, 54, and then there was one in the 70s. Um, there's been like four, I think. But anyway, mm-hmm. and you know, Bradley Cooper, certainly one of the bigger stars we have, but I think he'd been kind of quiet for a little bit. You know, he hadn't I been agree. in like a huge movie. I mean, the last thing I remember him being was like Burnt. Which apparently was terrible. Um, are you kidding me? What? He had a huge all right, role. all right, all right. You know what I mean. Stop it. That, yeah, yeah, that's it funny coming. Hold on. <laughs> that's funny coming for the person who yelled, not yelled at me, but was like, "Oh, <laughs> Bradley Cooper isn't voicing Rocket Raccoon anymore." <laughs> and I was but like, "Yeah, I he was is." Confused because that guy from Gilmore Girls, what they're doing is he's acting out all the scenes, and they they put the CPI CP. C- CGI <laughs> on top of him. So that's why I was confused because I said he was playing the raccoon, but he's not. It's Bradley Cooper. But I'm really angry that Bradley Cooper doesn't do press for Guardians of the Galaxy. So I agree that he has like kind of been like, mm-hmm. I don't know where he's been the last couple of years. Yeah, I he hasn't he's been, been in the spotlight. on this movie. Yeah, yeah I think so he's too. probably been focused on this movie. It's weird. He's one of those like, he's like an auteur. Like he really changes completely when it comes to the media. He's very quiet, it feels like. Uh, ever since mm-hmm. like Hangover Bradley Cooper. He's kind of, like, after that, I mean, not during that. Obviously, he's very much out there. And after he gets the Oscar nomination for American Sniper, now he does this, and it's kind of remarkable. I was not expecting that a movie we'd be talking about is the remake of A Star is Born, starring Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. I was really not expecting that. Um, And I have to say, the best part about the movie for me, it's definitely their chemistry. Um, mm-hmm. now I have, I have some issues with the movie, but I think that when the two of them are on screen together, it's kind of effortless the way that they communicate with each other, especially in the first hour when they're meeting and mm-hmm. you have that whole scene in the, yeah. the strip joint thing that they're at. I forgot what it was called, uh, where they like, yeah, a drag the drag. Box. there we go. Um, and I love that it's shot really well at those points too. And then the movie kind of just takes off. And it takes off at that first concert. One, when she just flips off her manager, basically, and just leaves with with her friend. And <laughs> then just goes off to the show, and then she starts singing. And that's, like, really the, I think, the money scene of this movie is when mm-hmm. she sings for the first time out in front of the whole world. Well, yeah. sort of the whole world, but Jackson, wow. What is his name? I forgot his name for some reason. I'm blanking. I think it's Jackson. Jackson yeah, May. it was Jackson May, right? Yeah. Um, It's really cool. Uh. Gave me chills for sure. Uh, goosebumps all over. I was really excited about that. I'd heard the song before, I think, like a couple times that she sings in that. And it really comes yeah, off really well in, in, the, um, in the movie itself. And what I have to say is that when during those concert scenes, there's a lot of them. You know, there's, there's a lot of like performance concert scenes in this movie, uh, mm-hmm. which makes sense. And really, like, it shot so well. Like, I really thought I was at a concert for a lot of these things. I know this sounds kind of cliche to say. But uh, what did you what did you guys think about I guess what what the movie was trying to say or not what the movie was trying to say how it evolved over time when it comes to their performances starting off as being like very pure and then turning into the the SNL performance 
Uh, and yeah, also might be minor spoilers for people listening. Minor. Just some minor things. Actually, probably some major spoilers, but whatever. Oh, can we not say what happened? Like this, like we can't. No, you can say what happened. I'm just giving my spoiler warning right now. For anybody who hasn't watched The Star is Born and plans on seeing it, uh, we're going to do some spoilers and stuff. So okay. be weary. I, didn't, I can talk about the ending. Yeah, but first just talk about just the whole uh, thing in general, what you thought about it. Like this, because it starts out being kind of a smaller, like the two of them, and then it grows into something that's very her pop star uh, kind of image, I would say. Um, I personally liked the beginning. Like, at least as far as the music goes, I like the songs in the mm-hmm. beginning. But, yeah, um, me too. She likes the La Vie on Rose. La Vie on Rose. Right, that was right, my favorite right. song. La Vie, my favorite scene. Um, but I feel like that's kind of the point in the movie because then, like, oh, her music's different. Like, mm-hmm. like I know at one point he says, like, she sold out or something. So yeah. I kind of get like, why that's, like, the way it is. Right. Mm-hmm. Kayla, what did you think? Mm, you my favorite anything. scene was the shallow. The sh- yeah. I like, I, I know that's like the thing. I don't know. I know that's like basic, but I really liked that <laughs> scene because I really liked that song. And it like gave you chills, but right. I guess it's like, it, they very like, I don't know. I felt like their relationship, and I know it's a movie and you only have like a certain amount of time, but I feel like their re- relationship like really went from like zero to a hundred like so quick. Right. Like, right. oh yeah. I know what you're saying. Like, that's what I felt like I had trouble like keeping up. Not trouble, but like they really like he met her and then he's like inviting her out stage, which is like nice. And then all of a sudden they're like full blown dating and they got like married so quickly. Yeah, a bunch so of other things I thought that went a little fast. Too. Um, I do agree. There comes a point where. And this is probably my biggest, one of my biggest complaints of the movie. In the second half, when she's becoming essentially Lady Gaga, um, I don't understand what that character wants. I don't understand where that character is supposed to go. She's kind of just cool with everything. And it's, it's mm-hmm. more, maybe that was intentional. Maybe they were just trying to focus more on Bradley Cooper's character, who is, uh, I'm just going to say this right now, clearly like the front runner for best actor this year at the Oscars, like clearly. Um, I have I have almost no doubt about that. He's probably gonna win. Honestly, uh, he was incredible in this. I forgot yeah, it was, was him good. after maybe ten minutes. I yeah, I him. kept like it, that's another thing, and I kept forgetting it was Lady Gaga too. But I think that's because she looked so yeah. different. But I like, mm-hmm. kept forgetting it was Bradley Cooper too. Mm-hmm. He was For sure. so well, also they aged him so much. Yeah, that's true. Like, he looks old in that movie. Yeah, he does. Which that's is like true. Artist, but like still, they made him look like really old. Mm-hmm. But I my... read or I saw something that said he worked in a long time on his accent too. Like it was like six yeah. months or something. Yeah, the accent's pretty good actually. I was a little yeah. bit worried he about that. Learned how to play guitar from Willie Nelson's son. Mm, really? Oh. Willie Nelson, yeah. what a guy. Yeah, but... his son. He like he like him and Willie Nelson's son like would practice guitar every day for a year. That's so he like dope. learned how to play like a year before the movie. That's wow. Dope. I love that. Which is also wild because of like the guitar solos and stuff. Right, 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 right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which they I assume look, were actually him. Yeah, they look really authentic. Everything in the movie feels real. It doesn't feel like it's drummed up. I mean, it's obviously there's like Hollywood elements to this movie, which we'll get into in a couple of seconds. But like the, the actual performance and stuff, everything felt right. It didn't feel like they were overdoing certain scenes, like trying to make the music louder in a sense. It just felt very concert like. I thought that was good. Um, yeah. But in terms of the Alley character, I think one of the issues is that the movie runs into is she, that character, and maybe this is intentional and I could be reading it into it too much, but she doesn't have a conflict like at all in the second half. She's kind of just like, yeah, I'm getting famous and becoming a star. And it's more about Bradley Cooper's character who basically the conflict is with Bradley Cooper's character himself. So maybe that was the point of the movie, but it feels like there gets to a point where Lady Gaga's character, Allie, is just kind of there. Not, not there, but it's like, she gets pushed into the f- the background in a sense that I wasn't I quite expecting. You, mean. you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. When um, they when he said the sold out thing, when he was yeah. like, "Oh, you sold out," I thought they were gonna like talk more about that because I feel like like she was kind of not writing stuff that was her own anymore, and that was like mm-hmm. noticeable to me. And I was surprised that they didn't like have her struggle with that like anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah, she doesn't. She just kind of, it just happens. You know what I mean? Yeah. She has that scene where she's like, oh, but it's not going to be me anymore. Then the agent person like reassures her. And then it's kind of done. It's just, oh, okay, yeah. we're moving on. So maybe that's just the, yeah. the limits showing of a two and a half hour movie. Like just the mm-hmm. confines of that and what happens. I also yeah. thought what you were saying about s- selling out. That's my other like kind of complaint about the movie. It feels like it's trying to say something about pop music. 
this feels kind of rude, to be perfectly honest with you, especially since you have Lady Gaga in the role, who is a great pop star, like an example of a great uh, mainstream pop mm-hmm. star. And it's like, maybe I'm reading into it too much, but to me, it almost felt like Bradley Cooper's character, now we're getting into some more spoiler stuff, it gets to the point where I'm like, is this movie trying to just demean what it means to be a pop star and say, oh no, mm-hmm. she's putting on makeup now this woman is causing me to drink again that's basically how i took the last like third of the movie that's what it felt like where the movie was like "Uh uh-oh she's doing snl and by the way every snl performance ever i'm pretty sure is like the worst of that artist's career but whatever uh so maybe that's what the movie was trying to say yeah every artist that they go on snl it's just not their their best it's fine i always skip it yeah (laughs) i never like watch the artist yeah it's never really that great um i feel like for me i don't know like like, yeah, like, he kind of was, like, getting cosplayed, like, maybe not as much, like, the pop star I saw is him being, like, jealous, mm-hmm. like, because mm-hmm. he, because, like, the whole, I mean, like, at least in the, um, because I watched the old one, too, like, the whole point of it is that he's kind of, like, washed up, right. so that mm-hmm. when he sees her, like, succeeding, like, that's mm-hmm. kind of more causing him to drink, because, like, like, at the part, like, was it at some, that show or whatever, is it at the Grammys, like, when he's supposed to perform, and they, like, yeah. Oh, they yeah. like cancel him last minute like i think like that's what's called co- like that's what yeah. i always felt like that's what i found to be mm-hmm. causing him to drink mm-hmm. is that like she's like getting super famous and successful and he like at the same time is like on the decline mm-hmm. for sure for sure um yeah i yeah like i understand this the text of a star is born is like that's kind of what it's known for but to me and i agree with what you're saying too i haven't i haven't like fully decided on how i feel about this but it feels like the movie equates being a pop star with being shallow and i just feel like that's Mm. an unfair simplification that they make there and i think there's more that goes into these things um yeah but i and i think that the other thing is like his character's demise of course um when he gets back into drinking and on all kinds of drugs and stuff like that's very much like the, the the focus of the movie i'd say especially in the second half um it's just it's just it just bothered me a little bit i was like eh it just feels like they're kind of tr- making it like, oh, no, this woman's a pop star now that's making this guy drink again and essentially, and spoiler it, you know, kill himself by the end of the movie. And it's like, yeah. oh, man, OK, is that what you're trying to say? Or is it just you're really just trying to focus on the idea of this being just kind of a character study into just him and she's more of a supporting thing to that? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Versus like, which yeah, is the I movie feel- about more him or her is what I'm wondering about. In this one, I think it's more about him. Mm -hmm. But in the old one, it's more about her. Mm. I was watching, like, because when I was watching the old, the Barbara Streisand one, like, it's really all about Barbara Streisand, that Mm. the old one. And, like, at least from what I took from it, it's a lot less about him. Mm -hmm. He also dies differently, which is a whole other thing. I predicted how he died in that one. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, when they said in the movie, like the whole thing, like, oh, I'm not getting on the back of that motorcycle if you've been drinking. I think they said that purposely because that's what happened in the old Mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. Like, they did that purpose to trick us. Which part? And repeat the part. Where she, that she was like, I'm not getting on the motorcycle. I remember that. If you've been drinking, and that's, and I told a leech at the end of the movie because I wasn't expecting it. I was like, oh, like, I thought he was going to get into a motorcycle crash. But mm-hmm. I think they put that in to make people think that because of the ending of the last movie. Yeah, a little callback, yeah, maybe. Yeah, he gets yeah. in a drunk driving accident. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Makes more sense. But that's what they were going to do. And but was, was, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you were saying how, like, this movie very much seems to focus on him. I think this movie also is a lot about Bradley Cooper. This is me just theorizing now. I feel like there's, there's a lot in there that he puts in about himself i feel like bradley cooper might have daddy issues it's just that's just what i got from that movie like that's just that's just what you know what i mean like there's a lot of just moments where he just kind of unprovoked just going to goes into the stuff about his dad his character and i'm like hmm how personal and how attached is bradley cooper to this movie because i feel like he might be trying to say something there's also Um, not really that in the old one mm, interesting does he have daddy issues no i don't know i like i said i'm theorizing but in, like the old one, well, first, like you know, like the guy, his assistant is his brother. That's not like the case in the old one. Mm. And also, all of his like management and stuff is like a lot like they're kind of all like jerks to him in the old one. Interesting. Interesting. Like that's kind. Of, it's like weird. Some of the differences, like mm. this one, felt very like, self-destruction. Like 
you know? Yeah, the old one felt less like self-destruction and more like people were actually being kind of crappy to him. Interesting. I got to give it a watch. Um, so now I want to talk about quickly, not even quickly, but however long I guess is possible. The big thing I think everyone's going to talk about is the ending. It's a very emotional <laughs> ending. And also it shows that a lot of people have, have they don't know anything about A Star is Born because even I kind of knew heading in. I'm like, I think I know how this story ends from just what I've heard. That is the and we didn't laugh at the end of it. <laughs> um, we did not. Okay, wait, Kayla, you have to now say what happened. Yeah, what happened? What happened with you guys? Um, well, we saw it, and <laughs> this guy was like, which I didn't realize it was a guy. It doesn't have to do with that. Oh, gosh. Here we go. Full out sobs. Like, <laughs> when I cry, so when I know loud. I'm big on saying I don't cry that often. I'm like, like you know, you hold it in a little bit. Like, you make up like... <gasps> Or something like that, but he was like, <laughs> 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 was <fucking> insane. <laughs> and Alicia and I like looked at each other and burst out laughing. But it was like it was a nice like comedic relief because I like was really sad in that moment, yeah, yeah. and it and it was really sad, and the dog made it even more sad. Oh my god, Charlie! Oh yeah, I think that's gonna get a lot of people. <laughs> They're like, "Where is dad?" type of thing. Um, but also, how did the, the, the dog get outside? He shut the door behind him, so that yeah. didn't make any sense. Okay, I thought I was crazy. Sad. I thought I was crazy with the dog thing. I was like, wait, did the? Nah, <laughs> I'm probably just thinking too much into this. Um, so, what's what's interesting at least is I did laugh, but it was only because I think we had other emotions inside of us, and when we heard that, it released a little bit. Um, yeah. I thought I knew officially that it was like for sure gonna happen when they have that line where he he repeats the kind of almost memeable line at this point the i just want to take one i just wanted to take another look at you you know what i mean it's oh, almost, it yeah it's almost become a meme when he says that again i was like oh man oh man it, it is I, I was right like this is my preconceived notions were correct um what's interesting is that i think that with the ending i don't know it's an interesting ending and i think that yeah, it, it was very sad for people. Of course, I didn't cry. I heard a lot of sniffling. I'm a man, obviously, as you guys know, so I don't cry, obviously. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but and by the way, Kayla, just want to just want to throw it out there that Kayla is making fun of and laughing at this person while she cried at the end of Infinity War. Sorry, I had to expose you real quick. <laughs> just want to throw that, that out for the listeners. Be fully transparent. <laughs> <laughs> that's still one of the greatest things i've ever heard I'm honestly still upset about it <laughs> it was like two weeks after the movie came out <laughs> i just said the, the message <laughs> well i didn't ever. look up any spoilers i was gonna go see it by myself but my brother told me to wait so i did and i didn't i really tried i didn't look up anything and i go on twitter for two weeks like mm-hmm. nothing now now for me i got a little bit emotional watching it for sure too uh one because i think it's expertly done it's really it's painfully slow like when he's it's dead uh, silent. Too. Yeah, it's like you see it. He's got he. You see him take out the pills from the car. You see the mm-hmm. belt. You see him like take a while where he just looks in deadpan into the, to to the camera. Really great shot there, and then he just closes the garage. Like it's so painfully like long. You know what I mean? Like it takes a while before, yeah. and obviously they don't really show it. Um, but it's like you know what's happening. And you're like, oh, just hurry up. You know what I mean? Like you're just like get past this. Um. And they kind of do. Uh, so I thought that was really well done. And that's just a testament to Bradley Cooper, who, first-time director. Pretty good for a first-time director, I must wow. say. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought it was really well done. Yeah. And what's interesting is one thing that got me emotional, to make it personal for a second, is it kind of felt like I kind of related it to Mac Miller's death in the sense that the reaction of the characters in the movie and the idea of someone mm. big that just died, like I felt that too about a month ago when Mac Miller passed away, I'm a big fan of. Um, like, I, I, I understood it on that level, where I was like, wow, yeah, I felt this last year, so I understand what the, the message the movie's trying to convey, basically. Um, and it's really interesting. I do like that they added the line in there that was like, it's, you know, not her fault. It's his fault, basically. Good, yeah. because it'd be a lot of problems if we went through that again. Speaking of Mac Miller, we had the little Ariana Grande fiasco. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Totally unfair for what they did on her part. Um but yeah, I'm just, I'm really curious to see what this does award season. I'm very curious. Um, I think it's. Yep, go. You can go. Hello? I, it... Okay. Yeah. What? I think, you no, go. go. <laughs> you kind of cut out for a second, but you're good. Yeah, um, Skype, Skype cuts out every now and then. I think it's going to win a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. 
I think the songs. I also think it sure. could probably win Grammys, and I also think Lady Gaga is going to EGOT, but that's a whole other thing. Oh yeah, that is a whole other thing. What's EGOT again? Emmy, Emmy, Grammy, Grammy. Oscar, Tony. Mm-hmm. She's going to be a funny girl on Broadway. Mm. Oh, which I... is what Barbara Streisand was in too. So, wow, they really are similar. They are. I okay. loved Lady Gaga in this movie. I thought she was great. Yeah, she's really good. I just think and that I'm she gets big, pushed back. I'm not not a Lady Gaga fan, but I'm like Alicia's a huge Lady Gaga fan, but I'm not mm. like a huge fan i I enjoy like some music but i thought she's amazing in this Mm -hmm. she is very very good for sure especially towards the beginning when it's more about her i'd say yeah um she's definitely Mm -hmm. holds uh holds her own very well and their chemistry really is probably the best part of the movie yeah um i think the songs are going to be up for with shallows and the other one i forgot the name of it right now um are probably going to be up for award contention for best original song he's Mm -hmm. probably going to be in there for best director uh, I don't think he'll win, but I do think that he's going to be in there for Best Actor, and he's probably going to win for that. And I approve of that. Um, I actually thought he could have won for American Sniper back in like 2014, but I had a lot of problems with that movie. <laughs> I just had no. I just thought it was ridiculous that it was nominated for Best Picture. I thought it was good. I thought it. W- my problem is that the Oscars like to pretend a lot of times. Here I get into my rant about the Oscar, about the Oscars fest as we approach the top of the hour here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Um, how like the Oscars, they always talk about how we want new ideas. And it's like, okay, I get that. But like essentially American Sniper is a pretty well done war movie. So that was my big problem is like, you're not, you're lying. Uh, <laughs> like that's just, yeah. that's just ridiculous. You're, it feels a little political on their part, but whatever. Um, Wait, if they, they want new ideas, then how would a star is born when? Cause it's, I think that like, star is born. Really, it's a remake. I think that a star is born has this interesting, kind of narrative following it where one it, it, I don't want to say it came out of nowhere but it is better than what you would think for a first time director the f- they, I think yeah. they want to have something with Lady Gaga Bradley Cooper playing directing and directing himself it's going to be a big hit it already is a big hit um, so they're going to have a hit that is both critically acclaimed and uh, financially been lucrative for them so I think that's important uh, I also think Black Panther is going to be in there this year for the record um, as I believe it should mm-hmm. be um wait when that... when is when are the when is award season again oh what did you say when Oscars is it the... are in like the winter right no they're what? next year february 24th is when the Oscars. oh is. when did black panther black panther so you mean the day it? before March. my birthday february wait when did they come out february is black <laughs> panther it's the day before your birthday yeah february 24th oh wow wait that is your birthday or the day after? no the 25th, no, the 25th is, the 25th is oh that's birthday. dope you got it. then. You, there we go. I already have my show plans for February twenty fourth. Then of what we're gonna do, Alicia's birthday celebration. There yeah, you go. <laughs> it's a birthday party. Fine, we don't need one for me, I guess. Well, all right, we already. Oh, don't guilt trip me. All right, we've already <laughs> mentioned yours like a hundred times. Okay, stop it. I refuse. No, no, no. Everybody listening out there, I'm not a bad person. Um, and. Yeah, I like I said, I, I think that the movie's excellent. It really is like a top tier film for sure. But I do have some problems with Lady Gaga's character in the second half and some of the kind of this dichotomy that they have there between lowbrow and highbrow and selling out and stuff like that. I hate anything that acts snobby in any sort. I just think it's really <laughs> ridiculous. I don't think highbrow and lowbrow art exists. I do not ever try to reference that term. It's ridiculous and it's a contrived notion to put down movies that other people like i don't care if that's literally something that i study for my major i disagree with it vehemently um but Good for you <laughs> thank you i think this i don't know if that sounds sarcastic but i didn't mean it like that <laughs> no i just it, it did a little I bit think that sounds good. it didn't seem sarcastic when i'm seeing you say it but over okay. <laughs> yeah that's when i get in trouble a lot because i text things and people are like oh <laughs> yeah your texts are can be very ambiguous <laughs> kayla's an ambiguous kind of person sometimes <laughs> she said some things that might get taken the other way i don't think they're ambiguous sometimes, sometimes. it can't be i'll I say some things off air that she said before but i've also lived with kayla for four years now True. so i usually am pretty good at guessing and things. she loves it <laughs> i love how close True. the camera is in front of your face right now Uh-oh. um it's, it's no it's fine yeah it's, um so yeah do you guys have any final thoughts really about the movie um are you rooting for it for best picture are you rooting for something else uh i don't know any final thoughts well, Black Panther is in the mix. I'm mm-hmm. probably reading Black Panther. Yeah, I think Black Panther gets in there because I, I've actually written about this for the Montclarian. So anybody who wants to check that out, it's themontclarian.org. I wrote about this 
uh, like last March about how it's definitely going to get nominated for Best Picture, regardless of how I felt about it. I think that there's a lot of signs pointing towards the Academy wanting to kind of push at least some mainstream movies. And also the backlash for them not putting a movie in there that's gotten huge critical acclaim and has also mm. been huge and is kind of a cultural icon for a lot of people. The backlash is going to be there. If you thought The Dark Knight not getting nominated was a, like a big complaint, then yeah. The Dark Knight didn't get nominated? No. Now you understand. Uh-oh. I hate the Oscars. <laughs> I watch them every year, but I hate them. <laughs> like, I hate the Oscars so much. They're so stupid. That's insane. Yeah. Wow. But they've diversified their voting body, uh, more women, more minorities. So that's one of the reasons that, say, Moonlight uh, won a couple years ago. That movie doesn't win with the old kind of crop of Oscar voters that they used to have. Mm. But anyway, Oscars, I could talk about the Oscars for like another six hours, but yeah. Do you guys have any um, final thoughts? I want Lady Gaga to win every award she's nominated for. <laughs> I she's agree. definitely going to have a presence for sure. And I want her to be nominated for every award. <laughs> Including like best supporting actor, <laughs> even though it's actress or whatever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she just gets, she counts as everything. Best choreographer. Yeah. Wait, yes. uh, best adapted screenplay even though she didn't write it just put her in that <laughs> yes. uh, uh, she yeah for sure so yeah that was a lot of fun guys i have to say yeah alicia it's I good to it's good us. to video meet you for sure yeah i'll be i'm prob- coming to north jersey on wednesday or thursday i don't know which one yet <laughs> oh really that's awesome yeah, Not for long, though. i have to confer with charlie <laughs> <laughs> my dog. dog yeah. Javi's met Charlie. I have. Charlie's cool. Charlie's. Yeah, a, I love Charlie's Charlie, so dude. I have to confer with him and see what he wants me to do. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. But yeah, guys, um, those are me, Kayla, and Alicia's thoughts on A Star Is Born. See, I've said it right. Wow, I did. I got it right like three straight times. This is awesome. Um, I was, I'm pretty impressed. Yeah, for sure. Uh, those, right. those are thoughts on A Star Is Born. Uh, recommend it for sure. It's definitely going to be. Uh, making the rounds come award season, whether it be Golden Globes or Oscars or what have you, Critics' Choice, Screenwriters Guild, whatever. Uh, it's definitely going to be probably something I talk about again uh, next semester, next year, when Oscar talk really starts kicking up. But uh, love having you guys on. More people, as I've always said, only, only illustrious guests come on the Digital Dash. And I kept that streak going today, uh, for sure. Aww. Oh, for sure. <laughs> You just made the most shocked. You were like, <gasps> <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, take care guys. Uh, I'll talk to you in a little bit. Um, and for everybody listening right now, we're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we come back, uh, my friend, Tommy Byrne is going to call in. We're going to talking, talking a bunch of anime stuff uh, when it comes to Naruto and my hero academia. So you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, I need to charge my computer though for that. So that's important to do. So we're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we come back, yeah. We'll get right into that. You're listening to the Digital Dash here on 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. And we're back and here, we're on, back here on 90.3 WMSC, WMSC Upper, Upper Montclair. Montclair. You're listening to the Digital Dash, and we have another guest. We just talked with two uh, very awesome guests with Alicia and Kayla um, about A Star is Born. But now, I'm really happy about this guest. You know why? Because it's not so often that you have guests on the Digital Dash. I mean, you have illustrious ones on the Dash. I've said this many times. I only allow that. But it's not so often that you have people who are the master of the dark arts, you know, <laughs> people who have the ability to warp probability in their favor, you know, and warp the probability in other people's not favor. I said that wrong, but whatever. You know what I'm talking about? It's Mr. Tommy Byrne. Hey, everyone. Nice to be back. <laughs> nice to be My back. Hobby. I'm glad to have you back, sir. Last time we had you on, we were talking about fantasy football, which is where I discuss in more detail about where your dark powers originated from. Uh, and how you're able to influence the outcome of things with the power of the reverse jinx. Uh, Do you want to quickly tell people what happened this week with your fantasy matchup? I just can't believe it's already been a month since I've been on here. Well, I was behind uh, 90 points in fantasy football, which is a lot of points. Um, I turned it off, or the TV off yesterday, expecting to lose, and I turned it back on at 11 o'clock, and I won. (laughs) That's basically it. Oh, but but you're forgetting a small thing because you got to show the dark magic part. Tommy, yeah. after he was down, changed his team name to he's been five and zero oh lately, and he changed changed his team name to five and one lock it in, and he used lock it because I, for Tyler Lockett is that who's on your team? Yep. Okay, so he made like a little cool pun there, and he did that before all of this happened, and then what happens? He comes back from eighty points. So basically, guys, what I'm trying to tell you is, 
if you ever need someone something to happen in your life, ask Tommy and tell him, <laughs> say you need a, a recommend a letter of recommendation. Just text Tommy and be like, hey, say that I'll never get a good recommendation and I'll be a failure in life. And what will happen is the next day you'll win the lottery and you'll get a recommendation <laughs> from like Steven Spielberg to direct yeah, the next Marvel works. movie. That's basically what's going to happen for you. So <laughs> so I don't know what's going to happen now. You know what I mean? I better be careful. I don't want to get jinxed or anything. <laughs> it's really, guys, I'm not kidding. I've never <laughs> seen anything like this in my life. Whatever he says comes true. Jay Ajayi, he tells John, another friend of ours who's been on the show before, that he was a bad pick. A week later, not only does he come back from 70 points, but Jay Ajayi tears his ACL <laughs> and he's out for the year. <laughs> it's really crazy. Like, I've never seen anything like this before. I've seen I good teams that I've not, <laughs> but I've never seen someone in possession of dark magic. So, yeah. Uh, what, what I want to talk to you about today is we're going into anime. We're going deep, 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 deep <laughs> into anime. Uh, when, when in regards to Naruto Road to Ninja, which is a uh, a movie based on obviously the highly popular anime, uh, and then also My Hero Academia, and that I'm sure is going to be a very, very extensive conversation about a whole lot of things with that show. Um, and I'm excited about that uh, for sure. I know you are too. Um, so, but first. Did you watch Naruto Road to Ninja? I believe you did. Oops, right? Sorry, we uh, we disconnected for a second. Oh, uh, we did. I'm back. Okay, you're back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Only for like five seconds. We're good. We're good. Uh, yeah. So I uh, I actually just watched the movie like two hours ago. So this is fresh <laughs> in my mind. All right. Good. 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 I rewatched some of it uh, last night. So it's fresh in my mind, even right. though I didn't need to because for some reason I have a photographic memory when it comes to movies, and in consequential information. But yeah, it's kind um, of insane. Yeah, it's 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 really weird. But um. I basically made you watch this by made. I mean, asked um, because I don't think the Naruto movies are particularly great, but I thought this one was like particularly good. You know, yeah, I thought there was I mean, something about it. Yeah, they do get a bad rap. Um, and this is the only one that I've ever watched. And mm-hmm. I actually really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just something different. Like they, they, focus less on the action and more on the emotional side yeah, which for sure. really is different and they step away from like the normal just intense action mm-hmm. um definitely different and i'm happy i watched it yeah what's interesting is that this one uh there's gonna be light spoilers that we actually there will be spoilers um not just yet but basically in this movie um naruto and sakura so if you guys don't know naruto then i don't know what to say so i'm not gonna go through all of that because it'd be impossible for me to sum it up right now but this takes place in the Shippuden series where they're older now. Uh, and basically what's happened is one of the main villains, his name is Madara, traps the two of them in a world that is the reverse of everything that's like real, like that's from the actual world, a different universe essentially. Um, so what I just picked up on this just because I just watched this. Um, mm-hmm. So Madara does say this world is created by the last thing that the person desires before he put them into the world. So if they desired it, then yeah, the world makes it that way. So basically what happens as a result of this is you get a lot of emotional baggage when it comes to Naruto and his lack of parents who died, of course, uh, many like tech before the events of the original show, uh, basically sacrificing themselves to save the village and they're alive in this universe. And for Sakura, who is mad at her parents for kind of embarrassing her uh, before they get sent to this world and earlier in the, the movie, um, her parents don't exist and she's the one who's the child of of heroes, essentially. And obviously it creates a, a big conflict, but it creates a really interesting perspective, not perspective, but they really go deep and I don't think they go into it as much in the show, not too much anyway, uh, about... No, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, they take a different twist. They build it up. So they started out as in the beginning of the show, they show Naruto or the movie. They show Naruto um, mm-hmm. where he is sad that he's alone. And there's Sakura that she's mad because she has her parents and they're really naggy. Mm-hmm. They go into the new world and Sakura all of a sudden is very popular because she has hero parents. Mm-hmm. Whereas Naruto doesn't realize that his parents are alive yet. Mm-hmm. And then the the show or the movie completely switches roles and then turns out that naruto realizes that uh or just the emotional uh impact of having his parents back and seeing that Mm -hmm. and so his desires come true 
whereas Sakura's desires end up being the downfall and she ends up becoming depressed and lonely. Mm -hmm. It's like super interesting. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, it really builds up. Um, What's interesting about this is that, you know, obviously Naruto's parents parents are gone and this takes place after he knows who his parents are and that his parent, uh, his dad was the fourth Hokage. Um, And what's, what's crazy about it is like, it's really sad. It's a very emotional movie. Like you mentioned they focus a lot on characters in this one, and you know there are some there are some reverses that are done in this that I actually think are pretty hilarious, which we'll get into in a little bit. But when it comes to his parents, that's like kind of the big thing about this movie. And it's really cruel in a lot of ways what he's going through, because at the beginning he kind of is uh, not a jerk about it, but he understands that they're fake and he kind of pushes them away because you know they're from this other universe. And then there comes a point in the movie, which is the the real emotional core point for me, when he kind of just accepts it and embraces it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I think that raises a fascinating it, um, kind of idea of like realness and does it matter if things are real? Almost like like if you've ever seen Blade Runner, uh, things like Inception. This idea of like, does it matter if it's technically not real? The Matrix, you know what I mean? Does it matter? Uh, and that's what it's a really, really profoundly uh, deep thing that the movie goes into, which none of the Naruto movies really do. They basically just focus on action and stuff. And some of them are, have their moments, but n- not like this. And no, nothing has really ever made me. <laughs> I got actually got emotional. Yeah, not like I did too when I first watched. Tearing up, but like yeah, you feel it. it. You feel the pain and like mm-hmm. the uh, individual like loneliness, depending on the situation that they're in. Mm-hmm. And then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By the end of the movie, Sakura and Naruto both understand each other's pain, and it's just a great connection between the two. Mm-hmm. And what I, what I thought was interesting, the, the moment that happens is when his mother, like, saves him, and that's when he, like, breaks from not caring mm-hmm. about these people because he knows that they're not, like, his actual parents. But, like, he's confused, like, why would someone do that? And it's it's sad on both respects because, like, for him to ask that, it's just, like, he doesn't know what that means, you know what I mean? For like a parent yeah. to just go and save you without thinking about their own safety. Like he's never felt that. And it's a really sad thing to think about. You know what I mean? And but and equally as kind of sad for me is when he realizes that these really aren't his parents when they start like kind of not acting cowardly, I would say. But they're like scared and they're like, don't go after this guy. We can't beat him. And then they have the flashback, which is when I kind of broke down when I first watched this. Uh, where it goes yeah. through what happened to his parents, his his dad and his mother sacrificing themselves. It's really sad, you know, him having to now, you know, carry the burden of a nine-tailed fox and what that means, and it really was a burden. Everybody hates him. Although, by the way, right upside thing, who was that character that has all the Sharingan eyes who's the one who leaked the information about Naruto having the fox inside him? You remember that guy? Do you remember what his name is? In the is? movie? No, not in the movie. Not in the movie. Um, just this is a random. Oh, oh, uh, Donzo. Donzo, like the worst character on the show, who makes literally yeah. no sense. He this guy outs sense. Naruto for no reason. Like nobody really knew that he had the nine tailed fox inside. I mean, he just tells everybody, basically ruining his life as a kid. So congratulations, Donzo. I'm glad Sasuke killed you. Anyway, um, he murked him. By the way, he did really what badly. Fool. Dude has like eight, he has like eight hundred eyes that are super overpowered all over his body. He still can't beat him. Danza sucks. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on. No, but we could keep going. At the end of the movie, mm-hmm. that final scene where he has the flashbacks, and if you remember when he was disappearing to go back into like the regular world, right? He says to his parents, "He's like, thank you for cooking. Thank you for being yeah. angry with me. Yeah, because he never got to experience that as a kid, and that's why he always rebelled. Yeah, for sure." He never he even really got cool. that. And it's like crazy to think about that. And it's crazy that it took this, not took this long, but it's crazy that it was this movie that finally kind of touched on those themes with the show. Uh, they'd been touched on before for sure, but not, I don't think, to this extent. Um, and also I wanted to just talk about the whole movie isn't super emotional. Uh, it's definitely, that's the focus of it. But there's also some good comedy in there. It's a very Freaky oh. Friday type of thing going on here. Uh, where a lot of the characters are reversed. And if you wanted to talk about, like, what are your favorite, like, changes to characters that they show in this? My favorite, right off the bat, was Hinata <laughs> when, she, when she threatened Sakura. Yeah, yeah that, that was really that funny. That was really good. Um, there's a lot in there. And, and obviously the main one being um, Naruto and Sakura, parents and no parents. Um, 
But actually, we're going to take a little bit of a break. I just realized what time it is. Uh, we're going to take a quick 30-second break. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of our favorite uh, uh, little character cross-pollination things that happen or whatever. So remember to stay tuned here on 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. Um, so I really enjoyed that part. I really enjoyed the Hinata like kind of change up mixer there. Oh man, I messed up my recording a little bit. Oh well. Um, so it was just it was just good to see or yeah. just different how everyone had something slightly off about them. Mm-hmm. Well, one one of the interesting ones that I actually like that they didn't go too deep into is that Sasuke is there, mm-hmm. and I like that they didn't. They just kind of left it. You know what I mean? Like it was just funny for a second how he's basically the same. Yeah. To an extent, except he's like embraces the he, playboy thing yeah he likes the attention instead of yeah, this time he likes the attention that's the only difference otherwise he still calls naruto a loser and he makes the remark like yeah of course you're still the same or whatever um and i thought that was really funny now one of my favorites oh man i, I mean i have so many first of all i like the it starts out with the kiba thing just the the little things like shino hates bugs now oh, kiba yeah. likes cats and his dog hates him akamaru um what was one of them? The Kakashi no, uh, guy one destroyed me. Yeah, I was kinda... crying when I saw that. He's like, let's go, it just, everybody. It just felt wrong, yeah. It, it just feels so wrong, and you're like, oh, he's using the Sharingan too much. He's like, I lost my power of youth or whatever. It's just so funny seeing that. Um, I just like the, the deja vu moment where, uh, where Lee falls down into the girls' locker oh, room. Man. Oh, man. Because they showed Lord. this in the actual show, um, but right. in the movie – they replayed again and this time naruto and sakura know what happened mm-hmm. and they try to give lee a chance mm-hmm. and uh it turns out that lee is actually yeah a yeah, perv <laughs> st- st- stalking them yeah. in this one i forgot i forgot about that in the show it's been a while since i've seen shippuden again i forgot that that happened but yeah that was a nice like little reference uh thing that they did in there um another one that i liked a lot the akatsuki i just oh, didn't man. understand it oh man it was so it wasn't that it was funny it was just such a it was really smart like what they did with that how in this world they're not bad guys they're mercenaries i and, just didn't understand that the whole hmm. itachi uh sasuke like how does that work in the new world how yeah i guess i mean you could you could you know draw conclusions upon that and be like okay in this world his brother still did all the bad things became a mercenary except that like it's just mercenaries now they just don't have their own they don't have a calling I guess you could say is what the thing was. Um, and I just I just enjoyed seeing that because immediately I'm like, oh, man, really? Like, really? I mean, I know Naruto could literally 1v10 all of those guys by the end of the show. But <laughs> yeah. at that point in the series, he can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I was like, That's oh, what, no. <laughs> yeah, watching this again, I was like, wait, why isn't he so good again? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's the weird part because you've seen this. You saw this after watching the series, like yeah. the entire Shippuden when he's, you know, the six pass mode when he's all orange. Great design, by the way. I love that design. Um, when basically you can fight everybody by himself if he wanted to, uh, like he's he's beyond capability at that point. And do you, and this do you it's watch like Baruto? Baruto. No, I don't. I know you do, and I was going to ask you about that. Um, okay. But in this one, he has his sage mode, which is like it takes place basically right after the pain arc when he fights pain. So he's still up there. Don't get me wrong, but he's not at beyond hokage and beyond comprehension level yeah. he is by the end of the series um him and sasuke both um and in this one so i saw that happen i was like oh man now did you guess that the masked man was him no yeah so is that too much of a spoiler or? no I, I, there is spoilers I, I told people hey if you haven't seen it then too late it's like six years old that's true. <laughs> like come on guys that is true there you go um yeah no i didn't guess that at all hmm I, okay, that part didn't make sense to me either. So at the way end, his black hair goes away and it right. turns blonde again. And the I, parents realize that that's him. Yeah. So why didn't they notice that he was gone before? I think that's because the reversal when he sent them to the world basically just swapped them out. And as a result, since Sakura and Naruto are a part of it, they get reversed in some way. Like one of the reversals was removing because naruto is there but then so is his other self yeah so where sakura's other self i don't think that she has one because i think that you have to have at least one of the people that had the parents die you know what i mean so i think that that's the whole point it is a little confusing for sure but it's kind of they they they, you know made a jump there you know what i mean they were just saying bottom line is i think that they were just like this would be really cool to basically see what would it look like if he was evil 
And what would what it would look like is he's basically able to beat the entire village by himself. <laughs> yeah, dude, <laughs> Which he was is better than any. Yeah, he was better than the real Naruto. Yeah, he was. He has like a dark Rasengan going on, uh, which was crazy. When I first saw it, I did not see it coming. Um, I had a feeling that something was weird towards the fight at the end. There was just something when he started saying yeah, that he feels he, weird. Yeah. Yeah. And I was yeah, like, that's, huh. it did give me hints too. Yeah. And I was like, huh. And the other thing was that, yeah, I was like, what? This is weird. <laughs> um, and another, maybe another reason is that his name is Menma in this world. No other character's name is changed. Their personality changes, but not the name. So oh, you know what I mean? So maybe that's what you're why. saying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's really confusing to like explain it, but maybe well, that's isn't, why. Isn't Naruto a type of food too? Uh, I'm going to Google this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it is? it is. I think it is. I know Menma is like the sauce and the ramen or whatever. Uh, no, Menma is the bamboo. The bamboo. Okay. I was <laughs> not close, but okay. Um, uh, soup. Yeah. You find it anywhere? Are those the swirly? Th- oh, they are the pink and white swirly things that you put in ramen. There, there you we go. go. There you go. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed that, and it was really kind of scarring to just see like this person just destroying everybody. He's super evil. He killed. That's even worse to think about is that he killed Jiraiya, um, in this yeah. world that he killed him. Mm-hmm. Um, that's even more disturbing to think about. Um, I, I mean, I, yeah, you were you were gonna say. Well, like literally, he, at the end of one of the fights, he just flies up into the air. He's like, "Oh, here, by the way, here's a gift," and he blows up the whole city. Yeah, yeah, it's very pain esque. It's yeah. like it's like oh, they crossed 100%. pain with Naruto, basically. That's what it felt like, where he's yeah. like he's well, creating those other shadow things, almost like Pain's other selves and whatnot. Um, now I have a know, question. Oh, go on. Did you know that Pain was uh, an Uzumaki? Yes, I did know that. There's like two clans, and he was like an Uzumaki or something like that. Yeah. So I think that's that's also a connection that they made mm-hmm. in the movie. Yeah. Like with that destruction that he's also an Uzumaki. Yeah, that makes sense. Um now what else is interesting is how'd you feel about the scene where he first of all, just quick thing about Naruto in general. I I think the original series is all golden. I think the entire thing is awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. it does have some things when it comes to we've talked about this off the air before about some things about female characters that are just kind of doesn't age well. But I mean, um, that's yeah, that's all Japanese shows. Yeah, it's just a lot of the <laughs> anime in general, except for My Hero Academia, which I think does it really well, which we'll talk about later. Um, and my problem with Shippuden is that it really there comes a point where the show just loses what it originally had, and it starts to become one that Naruto and Sasuke are like the only useful ones. Yeah, uh, and people are just so powerful in Shippuden that it's like, like I. I request that you watch like the theme song, the first like opening kind of opening for Naruto and then compare that to the last one where it's just him running through the trees. And then by the end, he's got the sage thing. They've got the, the ghost Muramasa thing that Sasuke have. I forgot what that's called. The purple thing. Um, And Uh you know what I'm talking about, right? That samurai. Yeah. yeah, It's like unbreakable. Mm -hmm. Um, Susano. That's what it is. Um, And, you know, that happens in this one where it has a, oh, my God, what the heck type of thing, where after he beats his, his clone self or alternate self, uh, Menma, Naruto faces Madara in that person's body, essentially, for a little bit. Yep. And he has the thing with his eye where all he has to do now is look at him, and that's it. If you look mm-hmm. at him in the eye or whatever, which I maybe yeah. I didn't catch on to something. Maybe it was only working because he had, ex- like, the fox was, like, out in the open now. Maybe that's why uh, that was going to work. But still, but yeah. But still, it's still pretty crazy. I think that's what it was, that regularly he couldn't do that. But now that the fox was out, he could maybe. But still, regardless, it's still like, oh, my God, this show is it's, it's insane. Oh, it erases his memory for a little bit. Uh, How would you feel about that scene, the fact that he kind of like, I don't want to say plot armor kicked in, but feels like plot armor kicked in <laughs> just a little bit. For like the final scene where he just. With Naruto, how he remembers everything. Oh God, yeah, I didn't understand that at all. Mm-hmm. Like, that was one of my my complaints about the movie. Yeah, I totally there. forgot about that. And I just watched it. Yeah, I. Mm-hmm. I think the yeah, whole exchange saw, with Madara. He saw the shape of um of like the the paper, yeah, and it yeah. reminded him of like the Rasengan, and he's like, "Oh, I remember everything." Yeah, yeah. It was like, <laughs> it's cool, it's cute. You know what I mean? Like to see him be like, "I'll never forget what my master taught me" and all that stuff. But it's also like, what? <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like. I don't know. I thought it was going to be some weird like jutsu that he performed on the thing 
before mm-hmm. it happens. Um, it is cool how he takes him down, though. That was cool. Yeah, I mean, that that part there, I didn't mind too much just because it's a movie. Like, they yeah. don't have... Yeah, it is a movie, you know what I mean? The they don't have, like, points. 500 episodes yeah. to build it up. And, but mm-hmm. oh, I just like your, your point before just going about uh, Shippuden. I... Or did you ever play the game after like NJ Ask or like the statewide tests, or like, oh or maybe like at camp? <laughs> Here we go. Maybe. Just bear with me. Yeah, go so for it. You, one person draws anything, and the per the next person tries to beat that drawing, like, and draw maybe. something that would that would destroy it. Okay. And you keep on drawing things until, like, ninety nine percent of the time, someone would draw God or like whatever, <laughs> and then the game's over because you can't get anything better than that. Oh wow! Yeah. Religious That's undertones being like. pushed on the the campers. I see. Yeah, <laughs> I like yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, no, but that's that's exactly what the show is. It mm-hmm. just like got to a point where they had to keep building it up, and they couldn't introduce anything smaller, and it just got too way too big. Right, right. That's kind that's of a problem with anime and ma- manga in general. How they're overworked, and they have to illustrate and write all these things like every week. So it gets yeah. to the point where the creator, uh, whom uh, Kishimoto was basically probably at a point where he's like i have to just extend things like the great ninja war clearly is just something that he gets he extends for as long as he could Mm -hmm. um especially when it comes to the anime for anime purposes but the original series like you you start to notice the slippage in a lot of anime you know what i mean um where like they don't focus a lot on the diversity of characters anymore in terms of like ino and all of them choji like they're not as important anymore you know what I mean? Like people yeah. forget, like they had that whole like squad mission at the end of the original series. And this one, it's like they have their moments, I guess. But they all even even dress work like they all have like kind of the same uniform at some point when the war starts. It's just like wow. it mm-hmm. just becomes very side episode. It doesn't feel like something you have to watch. You could basically just skip to when the Madara slash Obito fight happens. Exactly. Um, I did like how he takes him down in the movie, though, going back to the movie to mm-hmm. call back to his dad. Cheesy. Yes, but I still loved it. Uh, it was still really cool. It was really cheesy. Yeah, it was really cheesy, but it's like, I still love it, though. You know what yeah. I mean? He points at himself or whatever, and he's like, I'm Naruto Uzumaki. Then he throws the kunai, and I just thought it was really cool, and I'm I'm, I'm all for the cheesy, mm-hmm. cool stuff. Um, yeah, especially for the movie. Mm-hmm. So do you have any, just when it comes to Naruto, you said that you've seen, actually, I'll save that for one second, but I think that what's interesting about this is, like we've said it a hundred times, but this movie is a lot more focused on the emotional kind of character study side of Naruto instead of the action thing. It does have basically like a 40 minute straight sequence of action to make up for it. It feels like, um, yeah, but even so I kind of, this is the one movie that I enjoyed the, mm-hmm. the commentary and the non-action as yeah, opposed really to the did. action. I really, yeah. really did. And I thought that it was, it was just super well done, and I, I like that they didn't just say, hey, yeah, let's have more cool, it's a Naruto movie, let's have more cool action sequences, and that's it. They have a good one, but I don't think that's the strength of the movie. I think the strength of the movie is seeing these quirky little ways that they come up with to describe how characters would be like their alternate forms, because it, it has a lot of twists in there inherently because of that. I think that's really cool. Um, as we're at the top of the hour here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair, uh, talking about Naruto Road to Ninja, the movie. Um I must say though, uh, what was my what was my one? I feel I think the movie. This is I wrote this down. Uh, you've seen Harry Potter, right? Yeah, of course. The movie has this vibe to me where it reminds me of like this whole illusion thing, where it reminds me of the mirror of of Erised, the idea of seeing what you want to see. If you mm-hmm. remember that, which is the most like sad thing I've ever read in my life. By the way, is the mirror thing, the chapter in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's yeah. Stone for all the UK <laughs> listeners out there. Um, I'm sure they're up. Wait, is that really what they called it? Yeah, it's called the Philosopher's Stone, which I kind of like no in a way a little bit better. But no, whatever. Sorcerer's Stone. stone you like Sorcerer's Stone, but yeah, it, probably, yeah, it makes more I'm sense biased, in a way. Yeah. But yeah, we're biased. Um, <laughs> and it, it reminds me a lot of that, like the the part where he just decides to accept an illusion. I keep thinking about that, and I'm like, it's an interesting idea. You know what I mean? I haven't seen that movie in a while. How long does he stand in front of that that mirror for? Because I thought it was only he stays for like. A quick for like scene. He stays for like the the night, and Dumbledore shows up and saying says like, entire people have wasted their lives basically looking at that oh, mirror. Wow. You know what I mean? And I always wonder what I would see. I have no idea what I'd see. I mean, I have an idea, but I don't want to get too super <laughs> emotional, or crazy on the show right now. Um, but it's crazy. You know what I mean? It's a amazing. I mean, she's just amazing. Um, she really is. Shout out J.K. Rowling. Um, oh yeah. 
so any any final kind of thoughts now you oh yeah i remember you were going to talk about boruto for a second which i have not seen really i've only seen the beginning and i've only seen oh, the Bor- the last uh boruto the movie have you seen that or no yeah it's boruto the movie i've seen which covers oh, yeah, kind so of you, like the opening yeah you thing basically of, caught up to me yeah, right? <laughs> yeah which is what's funny you were like dude i think you're like dude i think naruto's gonna die and then you showed me the episode i was out your house this summer and i was like yeah. yeah i've seen this before i saw the movie one <laughs> they altered it basically and extended it but yeah the movie the movie for that one is actually not bad but it yeah. also it raises the problem that i have where it's like oh my gosh Naruto and Sasuke are ridiculous. <laughs> like, what, what is going on? That's basically the theme of the show. They have uh, basically Naruto's kid, and they show what he's like in school. He's he's popular. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the side, there's just that god, or I can't give this away, but there's mm-hmm. a separate war, and just Naruto and Sasuke, that's all the, that's mm-hmm. all the action that comes with yeah. the show. It's crazy. Uh, it's just, like, ridiculous, because you can't, person who can fight a god is naruto and sasuke yeah it's ridiculous i still enjoy i remember like i have my problems but the part where they unite at the end of shippuden and fight this team seven he's got the sage slash uh six pass mode on the orange and black thing that he has with the staff and sasuke just looks like a beast i enjoy it because i enjoy it from naruto's perspective i'll allow it when it comes to him because if you've seen from the beginning of the show the dude couldn't even make a shadow clone and now seeing him be able to do this is just immensely satisfying. So I will give Shippuden that credit. That's really cool. Um, I'm about to get a shirt yeah, that for that true. or something. Love that dude. Shout out Naruto. But yeah, guys, um, any final thoughts on Naruto Road to Ninja the movie or Naruto in general, Mr. Tommy? Um, definitely watch it. There's a lot mm-hmm. of fillers to skip. Mm-hmm. Uh, the movie, if you've seen Naruto, I'd give it a go. Yeah, for um, sure. Um, yeah. Can't recommend that for all the Naruto movies, for sure. I think they're average, but I think that this one's really good. Obviously, you have to know, have some knowledge of the show, which is yeah. if you don't, I don't really know what to tell you because it's there's too much to see. So I can't outwardly be like, hey, go watch 600 episodes. But in general, I would say I do recommend for sure. I recommend gets my stamp of approval is the original Naruto series. Shippuden, check it out. If you don't like it, then just look up online and like watch gameplay videos of Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm, which basically just covers the only the important parts. And you could do that and that might get you caught up enough. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break now. And when we come back, I'm very excited for this. We're talking My Hero Academia, one of the most popular mm-hmm. anime in the world right now. Uh, actually it is probably the most popular in the world right now. Uh, and how it's a super smart and creative show. So stay tuned guys. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. We'll be back. And we're back here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Uh, just got done talking about Naruto Road to Ninja, the movie, uh, with Mr. Tommy Byrne, who is on the line right now, calling from an undisclosed location. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Uh, and we both enjoyed it. We recommended it a lot. And uh, now, this is the thing I've been most excited for. This show. Oh, yeah. This show. Oh, man. <laughs> It's my Wait, hero. Did you academia. get me to watch this, or did I just kind of? I got you to all... watch it because I yelled at you a bunch of times, oh, right, and then right, randomly right. over it's the like summer, you're like, "Yeah." In the morning. Yeah, and then over <laughs> the summer, you're like, "Yeah, I've been watching it." <laughs> you're like, "Yeah," and I was like, "I told you, dude. It's really smart. It's like, it's really, it's so good. Oh my gosh, like, mm. uh, <laughs> so basically, for those who don't know, this one I'll intro a little bit, uh, because it's relatively new. It's only three seasons in. Uh, my Hero Academia is basically it's a super popular anime. Uh, that started back in like the manga started earlier, but the show started coming out like 2015, 2016 ish. And the basic uh, premise of the show is that 80 percent of the world's population has a quirk or power of some sort. Now, these can range from being like crazy, like you can generate fire or you have super strength or it's very small things like, oh, I can lift small objects or I can breathe fire from my nose or I can, you know, uh, what's what's one of them like I can control people's minds but only if they answer a question like really weird type of powers like it's a giant spectrum obviously considering that everyone has one um not all of them are just incredible and it's very much a show that's inspired by comic books and for the western audience type of comic books you know what i mean like the marvel and dc type of stuff and you can see that in the show which is one thing i like about it. a lot of the characters have uh attributes and personality types that relate to them uh, so it's kind of like that, and also it it stars basically the main character whose name is um, uh, Izuku Midoriya, and basically he has no quirk, uh, not for long, but he has no quirk. Spoiler, um, 
it's like three episodes in whatever um and basically the thing is that he doesn't have a quirk and he idolizes who is essentially the superman of this show and universe uh all might who's the number one ranked hero in the world uh, yeah i think you should explain that the uh, whole hierarchy of right. like how the whole society revolves around mm-hmm. heroes yeah the whole society is a hero thing meaning like heroes is literally an occupation now because like so many people have a quirk there's and villains to an extent are kind of an occupation because obviously people are gonna use their powers for for mischievous nefarious ways um but like there's a there's schools and that's why it's called academia where basically it's izuku's character goes to one of the top uh hero schools or whatever and you know uh we're gonna get into some spoilers so f- you know you're warned at this point nothing crazy but we're no, just gonna, yeah we shouldn't we shouldn't give anything away yeah i'm gonna we're gonna talk about some things loosely uh, just some things that happen and towards the end of season three, but we won't mention like character deaths um, or we won't, we won't mention the really like the things that we consider as being, yeah, we want people to experience this people who, I just feel like it's very known that yes, the main character gets a quirk of somehow. I won't, I guess I could explain that he gets it from a certain someone. Uh, and I won't explain why, but I'll explain some things about that. I don't know. I'll, think about it as no you can explain on. that that's the yeah, second episode. it's like it's like the third it's like the third episode you know what i mean so we'll get into that uh but yeah and what i love about the show is on the surface you're thinking a lot of people are probably thinking like now okay more superhero stuff oh yeah here we go again but what they do is re- it's so smart they have such a diverse collection of characters on this show and they also there's a subversion of expectations when it comes to those characters um, with the main character himself, uh, Deku is what his hero name is, uh, Izuku. He is a, he's like the most powerful potentially, um, character on the show. Uh, and he gets his quirk from All Might, who's the Superman figure in this thing. And he gives it to him because he saw something in him. And the quirk is called One for All. Uh, that's another thing. Every quirk has like a name to it, which I kind of like. Um, that's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, but he's like a super emotional character where it's like almost actually cries. used. Yeah, he cries <laughs> all the time. Scene. And it's actually like used to comedic effect. And what I love about that is it's, I feel like the show is trying to say something about who is strong. And just because you you cry and show emotion does not mean you're weak. Uh, that's what I get from that. And I think that's interesting. How the character who cries the most on the show is probably the most powerful potentially. Um, and just, I don't know, like where, where do you want to go from this? Like, what is your what? How would you describe what you love most about My Hero Academia? Well, yeah, I, when you showed me that first episode, I wasn't interested because the dude didn't have a quirk, and I was like, why would I watch a show where the main character is useless? <laughs> um, but then they explain that the show is um, basically outlining how he became the best hero in the mm-hmm. in the world or the number one hero. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it gets revealed literally in episode two that he's. He's narrating the events of his life. That's what we is basically revealed. That he's like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Izuku Midori, and this is how I became the world's number one hero, or whatever. Um, and basically, his ability. What's interesting about it is he can't use it at full power like All Might can. Um, and at the beginning of the show, it's literally all or nothing, which is awesome. Uh, and what what I love about it is he, the character that I basically think that Izuku is based off of is Steve Rogers, Captain America, where. The reason he is powerful is not because of his quirk, is because of what is on the inside, essentially, um, is that he's courageous. You know what I mean? What you see at the beginning of the show is that he's kind of like illogical about it. You know what I mean? He always wants to save people, and no matter even if they're mean to him and all that stuff. And it reminds me a lot of um, one thing that happened in the fourth episode, the defining moment of the show, I'd say, when he saves uh, one of the characters on the show during their exam, even though it caught it's like at a, his own expense. Um, mm-hmm. It reminds me of a lot of in Captain America, the first Avenger, when he jumps on the grenade, um, even though everyone's been mean to him or whatever. And it's like, that's basically who I relate Izuku to. I don't know if you see that, too. We're basically Steve Rogers. He's not the strongest. He's literally a, a scrubby looking guy, just like Steve Rogers was. And w- w- the reason he gains power is because of what he possesses as a person, not necessarily the the um, yeah. the physical abilities. Definitely. I think that's one thing that they really highlight in the show, which makes it so good. So. One thing that we forgot, or not forgot to, but at the school that they go to, um, it's the top one percentile of all the kids in the country. Mm -hmm. And so all the kids that he's with, um, they're all fairly involved in the show. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them are showed in every episode. 
Um, but what they really ex or what they focus on is that it's the way that you think about things and how you approach a problem, mm -hmm. which makes you a good hero. It's yeah. not about like your skill. It's about how, mm -hmm. like what you believe in and how right. you act at a moment's it's, notice. It's definitely about your skill, but it's not just people when they think about superheroes, they're like, oh, they're fighting each other. This show is very much not like that. There are fights and there is a great tournament arc in season two that I definitely won't spoil all of. But um, it's definitely about fighting because inherently when you have superpowers and other people do too, like there's going to be mm -hmm. a battle. But it's also about being smart with it. It's a profession now. You can't just be blowing things up. You have to get a license. You have to do this. You have to take tests. You have to have the right costumes. You need sponsorships. There's internships that these characters get, um, which is hilarious. Um, and But it's really like... I, I can't stress enough how deep they go in terms of fleshing this world out. Like whatever you're thinking about when it comes to what um, kind of um, problems would arise from a superhuman society, like the show does touch on that and they understand that. And mm -hmm. like I said, it's it avoids a lot of the cliches that sometimes happen with the superhero genre and with comic book movies or whatever. Um, and it has a lot of good characters. I just, I honestly don't even know who my favorite character is. Um, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't do a top five. I think mine well, personally. Maybe I could. Yeah, I probably could. Uh, <laughs> we'll get into that. But um, I want to quickly discuss what's his face. Um, uh, All might one more time is that I mentioned how he's the Superman figure. I've said. I think I told you this before, where I was like, "This is the best incarnation of Superman that mm. has been on screen in years." And I mean, like, literally, just Superman that type of figure. All might is yeah. this broken and self-conscious very worried character because he has all the power in the world but and this is revealed in the literally the first episode he is basically he has a normal form or whatever and then he has his superhero form which is like this smiling like <laughs> like poster-esque type of uh character who's like the number one hero in the world he's basically superman he's super fast um, unbelievably strong um basically impervious to anything but he also has his regular form, and he can only use his super form for, like, three hours a day at a time for an injury he sustained a while ago, which I don't think they've even mentioned. I don't think they've discussed that, right? No, they have, yeah. Did they? they explain I, how they got end it. End of season two, right, with the fight against you End know of who? season two, yes, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. That's how he got that way. That's how he got it. Um, so now it's like he's at this point where Izuku actually inspires him. You know what I mean? That's what leads him to get the power and i remember someone was telling me where they were like oh yeah cool Izuku's is the most powerful because he got the power from the most powerful person i'm like no but why did he get it is the point yeah he got it because of what's on the inside and that's what the show is trying to say it is trying to redefine what it means to be a hero you know what i mean what does that mean you know what i mean does it mean saving people what does it mean to save people what does it mean to do this how do you help people um and what actually makes someone most special is not just the things that we're born with, you know what I mean? Like the quirks and whatnot. And I really think that's a nice, you know, sentimental message to send for sure. And I think it's a really positive one to send. And what, am I, what I was getting into, I mentioned the tournament arc, which happens. And this I can talk about a little bit. Tournament arcs are kind of a staple when it comes to anime. They always happen. What I like about this one, and I won't spoil everything, they actually pick a winner. Um, a lot of anime, there's like a tie or the good guy always wins. The main character Whoa, always I wins. I never noticed that. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of insane. Uh, we just talked about Naruto. There's a tie. The village gets invaded, um, so nothing really happens or whatever. And by the way, quick thing, we've said this so many times. Just complete nonsense that Naruto isn't uh, promoted to tuning. I'm just throwing it out there. Oh, God, complete after... nonsense. He beats un... the one-tailed spirit. The one-tailed spirit. I understand why Shikamaru got it. He deserved it to an extent. Because he's very smart and thinks rationally. I like the way they came up with that. He saved the village from the one-tailed spirit. Like, come on. Yeah, he what what get are we doing any credit here? For it. He doesn't get any credit. I'm like, man, you should let the pain blow y'all away, man. He should have just let y'all. Oh, wow. I burped. Um, <laughs> should have just let that happen to you guys. But anyway. And in this one, I really think that season two is still my favorite. I still like season three of My Hero Academia. But that tournament yeah. arc, I'm going to watch actually right when I get home, honestly. Because that's I've been rewatching it again. Oh, season two show. is the tournament? Yeah, season two is the tournament. The first half is the tournament, and the second and the half is that uh, uh, the killer, of... the killer person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, who is another character that's interesting? That's what's crazy. Every character that they introduce to this show, I'm interested in. Pretty mm -hmm. much every character. I don't know about you. 
yeah, no, every single character, I can't, mm-hmm. like, if they are bad, you love to hate the bad guys, which yeah. is hard to get in a show. Mm-hmm. They even have comedic characters that are just for comedic purposes, like the guy who is super full of himself that has a naval laser. That's it. <laughs> He's super oh, funny. God, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a character called Sue who has who's basically a frog. She can, like, leap long distances, and she has a tongue thing, almost like Spider-Man-esque, essentially. Um then there's Bakugo, who's like the secondary prime character in the show, who's you think is being evil. And, you know, we talked about this a lot where they set him up to be like the one who's going to turn. He's going to be like Magneto. Whoa, whoa. You know what I mean? Watch yourself there. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, whatever. At this point, I'm just, you <laughs> no, can decide he is if you want to say things. such a great character. I um, think he is the most he's well deceptive. rounded in terms of like, in each episode, you don't know how he's going to react. Mm-hmm. And he's deceptive because my- he yells a lot. And he yeah, acts he like a, a jerk to Deku um, mm-hmm. a lot. And that's the point, though, is like they really mess with you. And I really think I really recommend people checking it out. Um, I one think of my, my favorite scenes. Oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. Just quickly. One of my favorite scenes is when they're in the or um, going for their licenses mm-hmm. and the people needed to be saved down below. And he was like, save yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. so funny. He's like, just save up, yourself. And, and then the person's like, right. what? Yeah, he's like, yeah, he ended up being right. That's another thing about him. He's also smart. Again, a um, kind of a counter to the stereotype of like a lot of times the evil yelling characters are like not intelligent. In this one, he like backs it up and he's like a smart dude, which is interesting. Every character has something to them that's like completely different. And mm-hmm. I was I was mentioning earlier about the diversity of characters when it comes to female characters. A lot of cool female characters on My Hero Academia. Um, Definitely. And I think my favorite might be Uraraka, who is super adorable in every sense. And she also has a quirk that's potentially kind of insane. Where oh, she with has other like, people? Yeah. Yeah, she has zero gravity with things that she touches. Now, the potential of that is kind of insane. And she has a fight against someone that I won't spoil in the second season um, in the tournament thing that – is when I was like, this is such an awesome character. And she's the most grounded out of all of them. Uh, where she literally, the reason for her wanting to become a hero is just like, kind of spoiler or whatever. Like she just wants to help her parents and get money, which is like yeah. the most grounded out of all of them. All of them are like, to save the world and bring about peace and stuff. And she's like, I just kind of want to make money and like save my parents and stuff. And what happens to her is like, I got choked up with what happens to her in season two. Um, Cause it's just like really sad, but also it makes sense. And I just love it, man. I don't know about you. Yeah. I'd have to go back to remember exactly what you're talking about. The, her I'm fight kind of in the tournament and how she oh. puts on a face essentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the other thing. Strong female characters too, physically, literally just strong female characters. There's like four that I can think of actually five that are awesome that I won't get into all of them, but um, Uraraka has a fight that, um, the show actually kind of attacks stereotypes and stuff where it's like, oh, why are you beating up on her? You know, that whole thing where they're like, she's just a defenseless girl or whatever. And it's like they have that thing where it's like actually the most sexist thing you would be doing right now is just to be taking it easy and being like, whatever, like this is easy type of thing. Mm-hmm. And even I'm going to say it alert, um, like Bakugo is the one who fights her, which is like the worst matchup she could have gotten. Um, yeah. cause he's, she's, he's like the second or most talented person there. And then afterwards he's like, yeah, that girl is literally anything but defenseless. You know what I mean? Like he yeah, was like, no. he was being smart cause he knew if she touched him that she might win. And she almost does to an extent. It's just, she's kind of outmatched. Um, but I really like that line where he's like, yeah, she's anything but like a defenseless person. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I really like, wasn't sure where they were going with that. Yeah. And um, they were, they were kind of in a smart way attacking basically these sexist type of stereotypes where it's like oh you don't don't fight the girl or whatever like take it easy on her or whatever and it's like no like the most respectful thing was her him treating her like a worthy opponent um mm-hmm. so yeah i really love bakugo he's awesome and i love uraka and, and deku and i even like ida who is this super brainy like paying attention to detail and rules and all that and he has like a speed quirk and he's just funny uh oh, God, yeah he's really funny in a lot of different ways um what is what do you think is your favorite moment from the show? Ooh. Mine would be that oh, um, thing I, against Uraraka and Bakugo's fight, but what would yours be? Um, there's probably two. Mm. One of them is the end of season two, okay. when 
I can't give too much when all my points to the screen oh, yeah, and he's yeah. like, you're next. Oh or like, man, that's good. That's good. Real good. I think yeah. mine is the Steve Rogers moment that I alluded to before. He's taking his entrance exam. The music mm-hmm. plays the you say yeah. run. Uh, if anyone wants to look up, you say run goes to everything. It's been a meme because it literally goes to everything. It's the best song ever made. Uh, I might even play it here if I can um, at some point. Uh, and when he saves her, it's basically the Steve Rogers moment. He gives himself up, jumps 80 gajillion feet in the air and one shot to giant robot. It's amazing. It is for me, the defining moment of his character um, and the show. And also, to quickly touch on again going through some spoilers here um hit deku's fight against todoroki who is also a really cool character who has ice and fire mm-hmm. uh, that's his quirk and what i love about that is people complain where they're like why would he he basically blows the fight himself deku because he starts egging him on to use his other side and todoroki has a whole thing where he doesn't want to use his fire side because that is what he got from his father and Actually, hold on one second. Before we get more into this, I'm going to take a quick one-minute break. So stay tuned, guys. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. And we're back on here on 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair, uh, talking My Hero Academia with my friend Tommy Byrne. We're wrapping things up a little bit here. Um, and I was mentioning his fight, uh, Izuku's fight against Todoroki, who is a character that resents his dad who at first is just this very quiet type, very Sasuke-esque, and then he gets they flesh out his character even more. And basically during their fight, Deku yells at him saying that he that it's his quirk and he should use his other side and that everyone else here is doing their best and you have no right to basically not try your best. And I remember someone was saying like some I'm a friend of mine was like that was so stupid like why that doesn't make any sense like why would he he just threw the fight because then what happens is he uses his fire side and ends up beating him in the match. And I was like, but that's the point. Yeah. That is the most character appropriate thing that he's probably ever done on the show where he doesn't consider himself anymore. He knows that egging this guy on might not help him. You know what I mean? But that's, that's what makes it. He's selfless. You know what I mean? He's he is, yeah, the most selfless character. He is the most selfless character. And he realizes that and even all might, I think mentions that too. He's where he's like, it might come to his detriment where he loses this because he's helping this other person uh, face the struggle within himself, um, even if it comes at his own expense. And I thought that that was such a, like I said, this is a really smart show. I really think that what they do with this show is beyond just like regular, like, ooh, people fighting and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that they have a lot of really rich characters that make a lot of sense and all of their motives make sense. And what you're saying or what you said initially about the show, too, is um, the way that they're carrying it, it's not about like character exposition it's about how um the economy how crime is going to change because of certain actions many Mm -hmm. um many animes and action shows really focus on specific missions and things like that Mm -hmm. but this show has like a backdrop of how is the world going to be affected yeah um yeah grand scale for sure um but yeah that's you got any final thoughts perhaps on my hero academia before we wrap it up have you um, seen the movie? Because I know the movie came out. No, I've no, not seen it. I know, the movie. I haven't seen it either. We should see that over It just break. came out, what, last week? Yeah, like a week and no, two weeks ago. Do you know when the new season comes out? Uh, I'm hearing sometime like April 2019 is what I'm hearing. Oh, wow. Sometime around then. I'm looking forward right. to it, though. Um, yeah, same. We should watch it over winter break. It'll probably be available like digitally or something like that. The My Hero Academia yeah. movie. Uh, two Heroes, I believe, is what it's called. And I heard it was really good, by the way, uh, critically acclaimed. Yeah. Um, All right, yeah, save it for me. For sure, man. Uh, so as always, love having you on. Uh, you're a welcome member. I love having dark magic on my side. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do you want me to say anything? Uh, yeah, <laughs> say I will not get an internship and that I will not. Uh, um, this show is the worst that's ever been put out there. Oh, that's just messed up. No, I know that is messed up. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> say that I'll say that I won't win my fantasy game tonight. Who are you playing? Uh, Luke Jackson. Shout out Luke right, if he's listening. You won't win then. Okay. Yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, guys, um, that's it for now. I'm going to say bye my friend Tommy. You can log off, sir. All right. If you'd nice like. to be on. Nice to be on, as always. As, as I always say, nothing but illustrious guests here on the Digital Dash. <laughs> nothing. I only allow. I don't know how many times I have to say it, Tommy. I don't know. I don't know how many times I have to say it before people understand. Uh, so, yeah, man, I'll talk to you later. All right. Sign on. 
And yes, guys, that was Tommy Byrne, the master of the dark arts, talking My Hero Academia and Naruto Roads and Ninja. Uh, yeah, we super anime nerded out, if that's a phrase. We did that. It was a lot of fun. And I'm grateful for having him on for the second time. Probably going to have him on in another time for something. Don't know what yet, but guess what? That's just how I play things. I play them by ear. Sort of. I actually do play in the show quite a lot, but you know what I mean. Uh, so when Tommy is free again, that would be awesome. Uh, love having him on. And now we're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we get back, I want to quickly talk about a game that is very special to me. It's called The World Ends With You. It's one of my favorites of all time. And yeah, I just wanted to give my thoughts on that. So for sure. And then we're going to wrap things up. So yeah. Uh, stay tuned, guys. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. It's the Digital Dash. Stay tuned. And we're back here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. You're listening to the Digital Dash and the waning hours here of the Digital Dash. And we, you know, we're we're almost done. Uh, I just wanted to quickly talk about uh, just a smaller segment. I'm going solo for this one. Uh, as I, I like going solo every now and then, unless I'm really tired. But today I'm not too tired. It's been one of those really good days, I think. But anyway, I want to talk about a game called The World Ends With You. Uh, the reason is because uh, not too long ago, this past week on Friday, uh, The World Ends With You final remix came out for the Nintendo Switch. Uh, it was released on October 12th. Um, it's apparently not the best of ports, apparently, which is what I've heard. Apparently, like when you put it in the dock mode, it is super clunky and doesn't function well at all. But in the handheld mode, it does. Maybe I'll get it. I'm not sure. Uh, I know it is one of my favorite games ever, but I think that I have like the, I think I actually have it for iOS, the iOS version. So I might just re-download that and play it because I'm certainly in the mood. But that's why I'm talking about it, and I want you to just revisit it. Uh, it's one of my favorite games ever because it's it's a JRPG that is really creative. You know, it's it's got an interesting combat system in there of a lot of touchscreen style controls and these weird type of motions that you have to make in order to make attacks. And the gameplay is really fun. You, you you buy clothes. It's it's uh it takes place in Shibuya, Japan. You play as a character named Neku, and like I said, the combat and everything is really fun. You know what I mean? Like it's there's a lot of uh, experimenting that you can do with characters. There's a lot of cool like different pins that you collect. But most importantly, when it comes to this game, uh, is the story. That is that is what makes this one of my favorite games ever. That's what really carries it and takes it into this upper echelon of. Uh, storytelling that I've ever experienced in a video game. And basically it's about this character named Neku, who's this kind of disillusioned uh, young man. Um, and it, it basically is, it's it's a story that kind of touches, it's, it's a really heartfelt story, you know what I mean? A touching tale on finding oneself in those awkward, like kind of adolescent young years. And basically the b- basic premise, and it's, it's going to be hard for me to explain the entire thing, so bear with me. Um, it's very Japanese in that sense, you know what I mean? Very, very convoluted in a lot of ways, but basically the main character is dead. Uh, Neku is dead and he's in this afterlife place and he's playing something called the Reaper's game. He's been entered into it. And basically the Reaper's game is for people who have died. And what happens is he has to win and he actually has to form a pact with someone in order to stand a chance and the reason why that's a big deal is because he's a loner. You know what I mean? Like I said, he's this disillusioned, very um, isolated person who hates people. It's literally the beginning of the game is him saying, get away from me, stop talking to me, you know, all this type of stuff. And he always has his headphones on and whatnot. But, you know, and, and so he's forced to have a partner very early on. So automatically you see that he's not in, he's in a very precarious situation, one that he doesn't want to be in. And the point of the, the game is that he, you have to fight these, like, dark like creatures or whatever you have to defeat them you have to accomplish a certain set of tasks he has this timer on his hand that you know there's it's seven days that he has to go and every day there's a new task uh submitted by the reapers who are the people who run the game and the point of the game is that if you win you get to come back to life and if you lose or die or killed or whatever in this thing you get killed by these creatures your entire existence gets erased (laughs) so yeah quite the stakes here and uh the world ends with you and what I love about the game is that it really is an all-timer story, and it's it's one that I've actually personally been pushing uh, when I've talked to people about video game adaptations, which ones could make really good stories or which ones should be expanded upon further, whether that be in a movie form, TV form, or just another sequel is, is this game. It's such a heartfelt story, and it's it's I love his character. Neku's character, he is, he's one of my favorite gaming characters ever. 
like like for sure like of all time that I've ever seen because he's this isolated person who is then forced to basically understand what it means to be human and understand why people matter why should we care type of stuff um very deep things like this very like you know a character that goes from being you know kind of apathetical to being someone who cares a lot and can he care a lot and why should he care a lot and there's a lot of things that happen in the story that i don't want to spoil for people who haven't played it even though it came out you know a long long time ago uh originally back in 2007 um for nintendo ds but it is it's so how do i put this you really like grieve not grieve you really understand the emotions that neku as a character is going through especially because a minor thing that happens is um one of the reasons he's in the game or not one of the reasons in the game but one of the things that it costs to get in the game is you give up the thing that's most valuable to you, which comes into play later in ways I won't explain, but the start of the game is that he has amnesia. He can't remember how he died. That's what's unique to him versus all the other players that are in the game is he can't remember how he was killed. You know what I mean? He doesn't know what happened. So he's playing this game, and he doesn't even know he died at first. You know what I mean? He's talking, and that's the thing is it exists in Shibuya, but like you're in this like other plane where people can't see you, you know what I mean? But you're there. Um, basically like a ghost. You know what I mean? That's basically what he is. Kind of got some Sixth Sense type of vibes going on there. And so he's trying to figure out that, and he's trying to survive, and trying to come back to life. So it raises this question, why is it that his memory was so important? You know what I mean? Why was that the thing? You know what I mean? Maybe because he didn't care about anything else. And where the story goes from there, man, let me tell you, it is just, it's incredible. You know what I mean? It's one of my favorite stories ever. I think that, everyone should give this thing a shot you know what i mean i think that i would recommend the ios version before the nintendo switch version just based on what i've heard um in terms of the docked mode apparently just being completely broken and it just doesn't work and that the co-op mode isn't all that great um i would recommend the ios version first also save you some money um but seriously like i really everybody if you check it also has a great soundtrack i forgot to mention that the soundtrack of the game um, this original Japanese soundtrack, it is awesome. And I actually listened to one of the songs. It's called Someday. I actually listen to it fairly frequently. It's really good. Um, you could type that up on YouTube or something. And yeah, it's just, I almost don't have anything else to say. I wish that I wish that I wasn't the only one who seemingly has played this game. Obviously, when, you know, when I look on Twitter, there are plenty of people who have played this game and plenty of people who know about it that are in the gaming industry and all that. But um, I feel like I'm the only one who's played it to the to the degree that I have I've replayed this thing like six times I love it that much because it's a story about I don't even I'm not even coming of age almost like coming of age um, which is a genre and thematical element that I've personally loved for many years but in this case it is very much like um an extreme of that you know what I mean like trying to survive how did you die what does it mean to be human what does it mean to have friends are friends worth anything you know what I mean are what what is it? What is this bond? How do we care for people? All these things are touched on in the world ends with you, um, and in ways that uh, you won't really expect. There's a lot of twists in this game, and there's going to be points where your heart just drops. You're going to be like, "Whoa!" Like I can't believe that just happened. Especially towards like the second half of the game, um, and obviously towards the conclusion. The conclusion is insane, and it's also it's a dark game, uh, very dark developments. Obviously, the fact that you're dead and you're trying to not be ceased from existence. And the whole isolationist type of vibe. But also, it is a very optimistic game. Um, A game that it seeks to answer these questions and these ideas of immortality and, you know, the lonerness type of vibe thing. You know, as we were talking about Naruto before, about him being a loner. This character is like Naruto, except that he stayed that way. You know what I mean? He stayed being a loner and he hates people. Um, he He doesn't see a value in having friends, basically, is the point of this character. And it's really great, guys. I, I've, I know I'm kind of repeating myself at this point, but I have to. I have to get it across how great this game is. Um, it's my pick of the week, I guess you could say, for games. Um, I know we've got a lot of new releases coming out, like just brand new titles coming out, but I really recommend people checking this out, um, whether it be the iOS version or Nintendo Switch version. Um, it's one of the greater stories that you'll experience. And don't be turned off just because it's a Japanese you know, JRPG game. Don't don't feel like there's it's got this weird stigma for those games having weird stories. Yeah, it's weird. It's zany. It's abstract, but it's phenomenal. You know what I mean? And you won't see anything like that in this type of animated kind of cartoon vibe, especially when it comes to video games. You don't really get a lot of that.
uh, Japanese stuff. They tell a lot of good stories, so I really recommend this game for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say about The World Ends With You. Uh, I actually wanted to have a friend on to talk about this game in more detail, but I do not because I do not have friends. No, I'm just kidding. Of course I do. Because I've mentioned before, nothing but illustrious guests on the Digital Dash. That's all I allow. Only illustrious guests on the Digital Dash. But yeah, that's it. That's it for uh, just some of my thoughts on the game The World Ends With You. Uh, we're going to take a break now. And when we come back, I'm going to really wrap things up. You know, going to wrap things up, preview a little bit of next week's show and what to expect. And yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the show so far. And I hope you enjoyed the conclusion. So yeah, stay tuned for the conclusion to today's uh, broadcast of the Digital Dash here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. And what's up, guys? We're back here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Uh, almost finished up here with the Digital Dash. Just wanted to quickly just say uh, it's been a great show, but also next week, just what we can expect next week, probably going to get back and talk about some NBA. Uh, I don't know who will be on for that, but I just I just plan on talking about the NBA next week. Uh, I might have my friend John on to talk about True Detective. I could have a lot of stuff, honestly. Could be talking about Maniac, the Netflix series starring Emma Stone and Jonah Hill. I'm going to try and give that a watch. But it's long, so hopefully I have time to do that. Um, and yeah, just just a lot of like. There's going to be some sports stuff because we we haven't had some sports stuff in a while. So maybe might do some NBA, maybe some NFL picks again with my friend Anthony, who loves to just barge in apparently. Just whenever he wants. I don't know where he gets off thinking he can do that. It's almost like he's the sports editor of the Montclarian and he's a super illustrious guest or something. I don't know. Maybe that maybe that's what it is. Um, but yeah, that's what you guys can expect for next week. And you know what? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that about does it for today's edition of the Digital Dash. Remember that you can always tune in to the show every Monday from 4 to 7 p.m. here on 90.3. WMSC Upper Montclair or the iHeartRadio app. And as always, to close things out, it's journey with separate ways worlds apart. Uh, and remember, everyone, never accept the world for what it appears to be. Dare to see it for what it could be. I'm Javier Reyes, and I hope you have a terrific, hope you all have a terrific night. I'll see you next time.